week, and point leader Labonte would have to carry his personal quest for points to the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Last week, Charlotte's Miller 500 the points battle took another turn. Benny Parsons won the pole with an impressive track record. But the fates had something else in mind for Waltrip. This incident with Kenny Reagan hurt his efforts for another Winston Cup championship. Richard Petty, Charlotte has not always been kind to the king, and again it sent him on a wild sideways ride. Bill Elliott, good driving and a pit crew equal to the task, sent him across the finish line, well ahead of the field and pushing him into a distant third in the points race. Harry Gant drove his skull bandit to fourth, just ahead of points leader Terry Labonte. Which means that going into North Wilkesboro, the gap is now closed to just 86 points with four races to go. Remember, 175 points go to the winner. The shootout is next on ESPN. Now entering its sixth season as television's number one auto racing network presents Auto Racing 84. Grand National Span, you've seen this scene before. The Brushy Mountains. In the background are the Smokies and the Appalachians. This is North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. And you know it doesn't take a headline-grabbing 200-mile-per-hour speedway like Talladega or Daytona to attract the fans. They fill the stands wherever they go on the Grand National Trail. We'll start 30 cars today, and most of the Grand National stars are here. It's the 26th stop on the trail. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Larry Newber. Bob Jenkins will be with you later this afternoon from Phoenix, Arizona. Dick Bergwin, as always, will be in the pits at a Grand National race. And working with me today will be a man who had one of the finest seasons ever, finest days ever in his career, Benny Parsons, last week at Charlotte. Benny, you get to this point in the season, and you just can't help but think about points. A month and a half ago, there were six guys still in for the championship. Then it went to five, and now there are fewer. There really is. We lost first Bobby Allison, then Bill Elliott, then Darrell Waltrip, and Dale Earnhardt. It's down to two. It's down to Harry Gant and Terry Labonte. There's going to be a thousand words said and a million written in the next month or two before this Winston Cup final is over. It's anybody's race right now, Larry. Another thing that happens at this time in the season, you come to Wilkesboro, you start thinking about Darrell Waltrip. He has won the last three of these races, the fall race here in the mountains of North Wilkesboro. Benny, is it simply a matter of... I don't think so. I think that he's really got some competition right beside of him in Neil Bonnet. That's his sister car. Those two cars come from exactly the same shop. Junior Johnson, just about 10 miles from here, and I think Neil has the same equipment that Darrell does, and Neil hasn't won a race this year. Darrell's won five. It's Neil's turn. As far as the points go, most of the experts feel as though that Waltrip is out of it. He feels differently about it, but who better to introduce the top 10 cars today in the starting grid but the man himself, Darrell Waltrip. Hi, I'm Darrell Waltrip, and I'll be starting on the pole for this afternoon's Holly Farms 400, along with a few of my friends. Starting in the number two position from Hueytown, Alabama, in the sister car to the one I'm driving, will be Neil Bonnet in the Budweiser Kentucky Fried Chicken Valvoline Chevrolet. Starting third will be Handsome Harry Gant, as he's commonly referred to, and I take that, use that word lightly. Harry Gant from Taylorsville, North Carolina, in the Skull Banded Chevrolet. Starting fourth will be Jeff Bodine, a short track expert, and I can attest to that because he beat me in Nashville, so that makes him an expert. And he'll be driving the Hendrix Northwestern Life Security Chevrolet. Starting fifth will be none other than the infamous Bill Elliott, from Dawsonville, Georgia, and he'll be driving the Milling Tool Coors Ford. Coors, as in beer. Six will be Terry Labonte from Trinity, North Carolina, I think that is. He'll be driving NASCAR's official airline. That doesn't make that the official car by any means, but he'll be driving the Piedmont Airline Special. Starting seventh will be Ron Bouchard, and he's from 
Fitchburg, Massachusetts, driving the Race Hill Farms Buick. He'll be starting seventh. Eighth will be Ricky Rudd. He's from Chesapeake, Virginia. He'll be driving the Wrangler Ford, one of the few Fords in the race, he and Bill Elliott, as you well know. Ninth will be his shadow, or his teammate, Dale Earnhardt from Mooresville, North Carolina, in the Wrangler Gene Chevrolet. And tenth is Rusty Wallace, the leading candidate for Rookie of the Year. He's from Greensboro, North Carolina, and he will be driving a very good car, the Gatorade car. What else can I tell you? There's a lot of more people, but they're all in the mirror. Those people in the mirror, the 6th row, 11th starting position, Tommy Ellis in the Morgan McClure Chevrolet, and Phil Parsons from Denver, North Carolina, the Skull Bandit Chevrolet. 13th position, Dave Marcus, Raymock Racing Pontiac, and Buddy Baker in the Babylene Ford. In the 8th row, 15th on the inside, Greg Sachs in the Sachs and Sons Farm Chevrolet, and Lake Speed, number 17, the Hesco Exhaust Pontiac. In 17th starting position, Tim Richmond, originally from Ashland, Ohio, in the old Milwaukee Pontiac, and Bobby Allison, the defending champion, the Miller High Life Buick. 19th and 20th on the grid, Kyle Petty, 7-Eleven Ford, and Lenny Pond and Dave Marcus's Jim Testa-sponsored Oldsmobile. Position 21, Dick Brooks, originally from Porterville, California, in the Chameleon Sunglasses Ford, and Jeff Hooker in the Hooker Morris Pontiac out of the ARCA ranks. In the 12th row, Jimmy Means in the Broadway Motors Pontiac and Ken Schrader in the Sonny King Ford. 13th row, Trevor Boys in the Hilton McCaig Chevrolet and J.D. McDuffie, car qualified by his son two weeks ago, Rumpel Furniture Pontiac. The last four starters in today's race, Richard Petty, yes, starting 27th on the grid today. Next to him, rookie Bobby Gerhardt. And in the 15th and final row, L.D. Ottinger picking up the driving chores from Joe Rutman in car number 98 and Ronnie Thomas in the Thomas Racing Team. Benny, just about all set to go green. Sometimes it's very exciting here at North Wilkesboro. I think the first couple of laps are going to be very, very exciting, Larry, because these fellows want to get it started. The pace car is off the racetrack. We're going to get a green. Out of the number four corner, Waltrip and Bonnet bring him down. Harold Kinder waves the green flag and we're off. Darrell Waltrip got the good start, but Neil Bonnet jumped in right behind him. Among the stories we will be watching, of course, everybody up front is keying off of those two red and white cars. That's Waltrip and Bonnet first and second. Hot Harry Gannon third will be following the points championship very closely. And Richard Petty, who started deep in the pack. Richard started about 27 spot, as you mentioned a moment ago, and he's not having too much success getting by. You know, the guys are not just moving over, and he gets into Trevor Boys coming off the second corner right there. This is a 5-8 mile racetrack. The race will go 400 laps. That's 250 miles. In a normal situation, that means they would have to make two pit stops. But the history of this race and this racetrack is five to seven yellow flags. And late in the race, you'll see most of the leaders duck into the pits every time there's a yellow. The race so far unfolding the way just about everybody expected. Wall trip. Bonnet out front setting the pace. And people like Bodine, Gant, and Avanti setting chase. Jeff Bodine has, has dropped a little farther back than I would have envisioned. I thought that Jeff Bodine would be seriously one of the cars to beat today, and Terry Labonte is giving him a shot down the back straightaway. Darrell Waltrip has won the last three, Holly Farms 400. That's the fall race here at North Wilkesboro. You saw in the background briefly J.D. McDuffie pulling into the pits. These are the cars running up front. There's Labonte. He has just gotten underneath Jeff Bodine, and Labonte now runs fourth. Harry Gant, remember, is third, and then the two butt cars of Waltrip and Bonnet, first and second. I talked to Travis Carter there, the crew chief on Harry Gant's Skull Bandit. He said he felt like they were in as good a shape for this race as they ever had been in North Wilkesboro. They felt like today was going to be a super day. Trevor Boys is coming down pit road, Larry. Well, Trevor Boys, the young driver out of Canada, of course, he's had an up and down season, but he says he's here in Grand National Racing to stay. There again is Waltrip, the number 11 car. Remember, he has twice been Grand National Champion in the last three years. Richard he Petty is off the pace going in turn three. Richard Petty is off the pace and having trouble. Richard Petty, who started so far back in the pack, he probably had that car primed to make an early race charge, but it looks like the day may end prematurely. There you see him driving into the pit area. Richard Petty in trouble early on here. Darrell Waltrip's not having any trouble, nor Neil Bonnet, nor Harry again. Darrell Waltrip, as we go back into the pit area now, and you see Petty has had contact. Benny, you mentioned that he had 
touch, and I think it was Trevor Boys, and Trevor has pulled into the pits already. Apparently, there was some structural damage, or maybe something has flown up into the engine compartment. As we look at J.D. McDuff, he was also in the pit area early here in the Holly Farms 400. Well, there's quite a ways to go here. We'll go 400 laps here today. This is the Holly Farms 400. Is it going to be wall trip all the way? Well, only time will tell. The Holly Farms 400 is being brought to you by Pontiac. Cars built with a feel for the road. Pontiac, we build excitement. And by the S4 Motor Oil Pennzoil. Protection worth asking for. And by Skoll Bandits. Tobacco in a neat little pouch. It's a little pouch of pleasure. Back right after this with more from North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Think of this season was the car running in second place right there. That is Neil Bonnet. The team came in apparently with high dollar financing, working out of the Junior Johnson neighborhood, if you will, down in Ronda, North Carolina. And everybody knew that Walter would be fast, figuring he'd win his five to seven races, but I think most people assume that Bonnet was in for three to five wins, probably his best season ever behind the wheel of a Grand National race car. But a lot of little things have happened. It hasn't fallen again. Had that one win, they took it away from him. Well, and you know, he. He really didn't win the race, so I, at least they did the right thing. They did take it away from him. But you know, the important thing is it doesn't seem to have bothered Neil Bonnet like it has other people there. He still Good seems point, to be Bennett. up and feels like that they're going to get it going. Another guy trying to change his luck, by the way, is Jimmy Means. See the orange car with the black hood? The black hood, that's become traditional for Jimmy Means painted race cars. If you've been following Grand National Racing, you know he's been running a red and white car primarily the past few seasons. but. His luck has been so bad, he's decided to go back to the color that he first brought to Grand National Racing Orange. And Jimmy, who is on his last car, by the way, of the 1984 season, hopes that his luck changes just a little bit. Hey, what if he keeps driving up on the outside of those front runners? He's not going to have a car left. <laughs> Daryl Waltrip, car number 11. Waltrip is a man who appeared on the Grand National scene about 10 years ago. He announced that he was going to do well. And you know something? He delivered. You know, like they say, when you. Dizzy Dean, I think, said about 40 years ago, it ain't bragging when you say it and it becomes so. And Darrell Walker, uh, some people call it bragging, but it's it's so. He can do it. Terry Labonte, it looks like he is the man who is on the precipice of being the Grand National Champion for this year. He has not a comfortable lead, but he's got a little bit of breathing room. Right now he runs in fourth place. And in talking with him this week, they're totally preoccupied. Maybe that's overstated perhaps just a bit, but they seem to be very preoccupied about the points championship. Of course, you've got to be ready to deal with the races on a race to race basis when they come up. But the points is what you hear the most about when you're talking to Labonte. We ask him, is it exciting? Is it exciting? Is it is it something you think about when you go out to eat at dinner and you talk with your non racing friends? No, <laughs> I don't. I don't even talk about it. You know, as far as the championship and all that's concerned, uh, you know, like I said, it's it's so far away. There's still a lot of races left. The points are still real tight. So I really don't even think about it. I still go into every race with the attitude that, hey, we're all tied. So we just got to run as hard as we can and try to win. He can tell some people that, Larry, but he can't tell me that he don't think about points every minute of every day because that's all that's on his mind. Well, Benny, you've been in the position that Terry and Harry and to a lesser degree, Daryl and Dale Earnhardt and Bill Elliott are right now. Again, they're the leaders. 20 line laps completed. We'll go 400. Is too much made of the points deal? Oh, no, no, there's not too much because it is a big deal. This guy's going to win. Terry Labonte or Harry again, in my estimation, is going to win somewhere around $300,000 cash money. I mean, right now, cash, not uh, what you're going to do in the future and what have you. I'm talking right now, $300,000. You can't make light of something of that stature. Well, in case you don't have it memorized yet, it's Waltrip in the white number 11 and Neil Bonnet in the white number 12. You're going to have plenty of time to memorize those names and numbers as a combo because we're going to see a lot of those, particularly in the next 15 minutes of this race here at North Wilson. It's occurred. You see Neil Bonnet in the gold numeral 12 getting to the inside of Darrell Waltrip, who has led this race since the drop of the green flag. We've gone 33 laps. And Daryl Waltrip has finally given up his hold on the first position. Harry Gant has also used Waltrip slowing down. And Benny, you noticed it, that Daryl seemed to be a little bit off of the early pace he had in this race. 
Gann has moved in. It looks like he's ready now to put the challenge to Darrell. Well, we can see in just a couple of laps that Neil Bonnet has put a little distance on Darrell Walter. So as you, we talked about during the commercial break, Darrell seems to have lost just a little bit. Now there's Terry Labonte, our points leader. He is currently in fourth position, but you just have the feeling that even though he is about, oh, let's get the differential here on the racetrack, maybe a half a straightaway. There you see it on the screen. A half a straightaway, two thirds of a straightaway behind the leaders. He's just about where he wants to be. He needs to keep everybody in sight. All he wants to do is have a good solid race, record a nice top five finish, and it's like a victory for him. That's exactly what he wants. Uh, he don't want to get in any trouble. He don't want to race with anybody. He wants to finish this race and never have raced with the soap. Meanwhile, Neil Bonnet has really put some distance on Darrell Walter. So Darrell is having some problems with his chassis right now. But Darrell Walter is a, a pro. He'll be able to adjust it. He'll be heard from before the day's over, I would imagine. Benny, you know, earlier we were talking about Gary Nelson and the Miller High Life crew, the Dygard people, going back to what worked in the past for Bobby Allison. Here's a real good example of going back to what has treated you fine in years past. I understand that this race car reconstructed in the second half of the season is basically the same setup that Junior Johnson used three, four years ago to win here. That's exactly what I heard. That Junior said, I'm going back to the basics. To heck with all this new technology. I'm going to try the old stuff that used to work. And evidently it is working today. Now, sometimes what is old is still good, That's you know. True. Fifth and sixth has been hotly contested all day. Ironically enough, car number five right now holds the fifth position. One of the more successful teams of the 1984 season, Jeff Bodine. It was a brand new team this year, but they've won a couple of races, haven't they, Dick Berggren? Well, Jeff Bodine is not the only one that's working with an old-style chassis. A fellow named Darrell Waltrip is also working with an old-style chassis. His crew says the, I the idea of the design really goes back to about 1965. How well does it work? This car that Waltrip is in today won five races this year. Bristol, Martinsville, Richmond, Nashville, and Darlington. So I'd say it works pretty well. Of course, Darrell Waltrip is a man who this year has had kind of an up and down year. He's noted for those patented late season drives where he'll put together the last 12 or 15 races of the year. He finishes in the top three every time and wins about half of them. Well, but this year has been a little bit of an exception. He has put together some fine finishes and some victories, but he has had a lot of trouble, more trouble than Walter normally encounters. Last week at Charlotte, Carl was running super. He and Ken Reagan got together. He crashed coming off turn four. There's the leader, Neil Bonnet, coming by to complete lap number 44. And Darrell Waltrip, they're the third car on the screen on the far right-hand side of the screen. You know, Benny, he's staying within sight of Bonnet. You can see the average speed here, almost 105 miles per hour after 40 laps. By the way, the average speed for pole setter Waltrip was 113. So pretty good pace here for green flag race conditions. You start out with a heavier race car, and pretty good speed. It is a good speed. There is uh, Rusty Wallace, Ricky Rudd, and Tim Richmond. That's the race for ninth spot. And Tim, Ricky Rudd in the 15 car, Larry, if you remember, dominated this race back in the spring. Well, he and sure did. As a matter of fact, Rudd and the car right behind him, Tim Richmond, won the race. Exactly the right. The point I was going to make, those two guys there, the yellow blue number 15, the Wrangler Blue Bell car, and the old Milwaukee Red of Richmond, those were the two lead paragraph stories of this race. Rudd sat on a pole. He led 290 laps. But he lost the red and gold car with a late yellow, just scrambled everything. And now they're racing for 10th and 11th. So. You know, who knows about this business? This stock car racing, it just changes from week to week. One week you have the combination, next week you don't have anything. You're grasping air. Benny, what of Ricky Rudd? You know, he was very optimistic, obviously, getting a new ride with an established team like Bud Moore's. Started out the season, had two or three poles the first month. We were talking last night, we kind of likened the, cur the career this year of Ricky Rudd to Michael Andretti in IndyCar racing. Started out not like a house of fire, but pretty fast, second half of the year program really tailed off. I really don't have an explanation for that, Larry, because I felt like it looked like that was the, the marriage of all time because they won three or four poles the first six races of the year, won a couple of races, and I said, hey, these guys are unbeatable. But for the last two or three months, the combination has went away, and I don't have an answer for it. Well, here's something interesting to ponder. You know, Richmond really wasn't in a position. Oh, and look, here's Rudd getting a little high coming out of turn number four. You can see him skating as he came 
downhill there. The front stretch here goes downhill, giving Richmond some room on the inside. Rudd now fighting and scratching and clawing for his ninth position life, if you will. There's Rudd on the high side, Richmond on the low side. The point I was about to make, the position that Richmond is in right now, and look who's popping in there, Bobby Allison. It's about the same position he was in in the spring, running, uh, oh, in the top ten, but not really challenging for the lead. But they had that late caution flag. His crew put on four good tires and did a super pit stop. Tim Richmond wins the race. So, hey, you know, we're not saying that Neil Bonnet or Darrell Walter or Harry Gantz going to win this race today. It's a long ways to go, Larry. It sure is, Benny. Just to put it in perspective, you saw the graphic a couple seconds ago. We got 50 laps down, 350 laps to go. Yellow flags are always an intriguing part of the story in Grand National Racing. We anticipate uh, about five or so, but you just never know. A year ago, this race went. Bobby Allison's computer, he, by the way, in the white number 22, said that the race would have seven cautions. Well, the computer was wrong because we only had one a year ago this race. Oh, this is great racing. Tim Richmond, he wants by Ricky Rudd Wolf in it. I love it, but they would be better served if they'd get Oh, J.D. Oh, getting JD. in trouble. Oh, oh. oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, that gives you something to think about when oh, you yeah. follow him. <laughs> J.D. McDuffie was trying to pass Ricky Rudd and Tim Richmond. You know, Jeff, his son, qualified that car, performed pretty well two weeks ago. J.D. made that early pit stop, and what we don't know is if that's J.D. or Jeff. That's true, but he, we do know that he has four new tires, better well, tires than Ricky Rudd and Tim Richmond. Did. Well, they were new prior to the last time that the car went around turns one and two. This is a way to heat up the tires pretty good in the bin. It really is. <laughs> Well, J.D. says, hey, I'm going to pass these guys, but he loses it going in turn one. And how in the world he kept from hitting Ricky Rudd's left rear quarter as he brought the car back is beyond me. Well, the experience there, there was no overcorrection, and that's something you'll see a young, inexperienced driver do more often than not, is to overcorrect once you lose control. Exactly you know, right. something we've had a lot of fun with in ESPN broadcast are track backs. Fuel is often a factor, and here's one about fuel in Grand National Racing. Racing fuel tanks are designed for safety. The inlet area is very large to allow the fuel to go in very quickly. There's a good sized exhaust outlet here, but it's designed so that if the car is on its side or upside down, a ball check mechanism ensures that none of the fuel can escape. Quite a ways to go. We still have about 15 cars in the lead lap. The leaders are Bonnet, Waltrip, Gant, Labani, and Jeff Bodine. Certainly, you cannot count any of those guys out, plus the 10 others on the lead lap. World Endurance cars, obviously, these are not World Endurance cars. The Fuji 1000 scheduled originally for today will not be seen until after this event is over. We are at the North Wilkesboro Speedway for Grand National Stock Cars. Grand National Stock Cars at North Wilkesboro Speedway. The good old boys are really at home here, and Neil Bonnet is finding the home seat inside of Junior Johnson's car very comfortable, at least to this point, here in this 400-lap race. There is a tussle going on for 10th and 11th. Tim Richmond, you see he's made contact with somebody in the left front, and Bobby Allison, the man who came into this season as the defending champion, and I guess a lot of people at least have expected him to repeat. But for Bobby, it's been a real up and down year. Dick Bergman has been watching this situation as he has followed the Grand National Trail on ESPN and, and of course, the two magazines, which he is the editor of. Well, not only has it been an up and down year for Allison, it's also been a year on the road, or in most cases, in the air. Allison flies his own plane back and forth to short track races all over the countryside. And last night, he was at the Hialeah Speedway in Florida. He hasn't been there for 21 years. His crew brought the car from Birmingham, Alabama. He ran it there last night. He was running very well. He had some problems with it, had to retire, and he flew up this morning. Just got in in time for this race. Uh, an hour before the race was supposed to start, Allison still hadn't landed. They were kind of looking around, hoping he was going to show up. He is certainly the most active stock car driver in this league. You know, Benny, that Hialeah area is where Bobby is originally from, and I had the privilege back in 1962 of watching Bobby and Donnie in their super modifieds at the flat one-third mile of both Hialeah and the Palmetto Speedways. It was quite a sight to see. They have always been competitive. Bob Jenkins took an opportunity to talk with Bobby a couple weeks ago about this season. How was it, Bobby? Well, Bobby, reach way down deep inside and... Tell me how you feel about this 1984 season that really hasn't been all that good for you after a, a really sterling performance last year in the driving championship. 
Well, that's true. Somehow we certainly lost our grip on uh, on, on our effort, and uh, it, it's real disappointing to review. And of course, hindsight being 2020, you can look back and see things that uh, you know mistakes that were made and decisions that uh, could have gone a different way and and all that. But uh, our effort has been as sincere as it ever was, and. Uh, the effort has also been as strong as it ever was. Uh, you know, we, we've worked hard. Uh, we've tried real hard to make the right decisions, and we made some mistakes along the way. And uh, the only thing I can say at this point is I'm just really glad that we were able to keep it together all the way last year, uh, and that uh, you know we did get the championship behind us. We've got. A lot of future out there ahead of us, and maybe this year we can use as a, you know, a regrouping and, and reorganizing our thinking year. And uh, uh, still, with the success we've had so far, it allow us to start off at least in pretty good shape next year. Bobby, I know publicity isn't something that a race driver seeks, but quite honestly, you haven't had a lot of publicity this year. Less than 12 months ago, you were having dinner with the president of New York City, and this year, not a whole lot of headlines. How do you adjust to that? Well, from a from a standpoint of our whole team concept, uh, it's difficult because if we're doing what we want to do, then uh, then we will be in there. Uh, from a personal standpoint, uh, there are so many people around the country that have made me feel super and continue to make me feel super that I don't feel a bit neglected by uh, by the idea of not picking up a, a paper or uh, flipping on a TV and and uh, hearing my name mentioned, but uh, it's something that uh, is all part of the the whole overall picture that we're involved in. Uh, you know, if you work hard, uh, then you are uh, in the middle of uh, the picture. Well, right now he's moving up. He was lollygagging in 15th position about 20 laps ago. Now he's moved to seventh. He's fighting with Elliott and Rusty Wallace. Rusty Wallace is running sixth right now, so Allison, and there is the fifth place car of Jeff Bodine. It's getting tight up front, oh, and Allison's on the move. That's a great shot, great race. And the fans are loving it, and we've had trouble in the back stretch. It's Darrell Waltrip. Darrell Waltrip spinning coming out of turn number two. It's very unlikely to see this champion lose control of the race car unless something has gone wrong or somebody touched him, Benny. I tell you what, he's moving like there's nothing wrong. As we mentioned a moment ago, he was having a little bit of trouble with his chassis. Damage to the left rear quarter panel. That oh, could have contributed. He probably got into, into someone, another car, maybe a back marker as they ex exited turn two around one Darrell. I didn't see it. Well, everybody will be pitting. We are at lap number 78. Now, if we had gone completely green, the cars could actually have gone 160 laps here. Really at lap number 78, we are less than 50 miles into the race, and that's less than halfway that most of the guys can go on a load of fuel, but all the leaders will use this as an opportunity to pit. Now, who has stayed out on the track is Labonte, and Benny, that's pretty important, isn't it? Well, he's trying to get five bonus points. There is a bonus, five-point bonus situation if you lead a lap. Terry Labonte right now has qualified for that. He's led a lap and it means everything in the Winston Cup Championship. Well, Benny, I wasn't watching, but you know, Bonnet pits on the first turn side of the start-finish line. It's conceivable that Neil Bonnet did lead that lap in the pit area, and Labonte, Labonte just, he just led this lap. He just led this lap, so Terry Labonte picks up the five points. There you see Dale Inman and crew going to work. Dale Inman, without a doubt, really one of the finest crew chiefs in Grand National Racing. He's been around since before Hector was a pup, and he's won a lot of Hector's races, hasn't he? Uh, he really has. I think that Dale Inman, as a crew chief, the record is something like 185 to 90 victories. He was the crew chief on Richard Petty's car for many, many years later. Yesterday, talking in the pits with him, you know, he's interested in all kinds of racing, and I think that's one of the things that contributes to being a successful crew chief. As we now go back and look at Darrell Waltrip, the reason for this yellow flag, Dale Inman wanted to know about the Phoenix IndyCar race today. He wanted to tune into that also. They're, they were beating out the left front fender on Darrell's car. I don't see any damage on the outside, but they had a hammer in and was working on the left front fender. There's obviously been contact with the left rear also, but I don't believe that Waltrip lost a lap. He got right back on the throttle as soon as that incident occurred down the backstretch. 
Here's the man who has dominated the last 50 laps of this race, looking for win number one, Neil Bonnet. the time spun down the backstretch. We are yet to determine the exact cause of it. Looked like he'd made contact with one of the cars he was lapping. There you see the top five behind Neil Bonnet, Harry Gant, Dale Earnhardt. He's been quiet today, but after this series of pit stops, there he is. And Labonte, the points leader, is fourth. Dale Earnhardt has made, probably made one of the most serious charges today. He started about 11th or 12th spot and now is in third. And he's, he had his high groove outfit working for him. He runs the, a very high groove, a high line more so than some of the other competitors. It seemed to be working for him very well today, Larry. Dale Earnhardt might be a voice to be reckoned with. Two abreast restart here. The lap car is down to the inside. Bonnet has once again risen to the top like good solid cream, and now he's got an open racetrack. We're about to see just exactly how fast Neil Bonnet is today, at least at this point in this race. Well, I think the whole race has changed now, Larry, because we've had a caution flag. They've been able to adjust the cars. They've got on four tires. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. Is Neil Bonnet going to be able to maintain the dominance that he showed? Right now, he's having no trouble doing it. Now, somebody else I'm watching deep in the pack, and we'll see if this comes to fruition or not. Bobby Allison looks real fast again, Benny. He got like three guys going down the backstretch here at the restart. He's behind a guy you know pretty well. What's his name? Phil Parsons? Phil but, Parsons, yeah. yes. <laughs> Here are the leaders. That is Neil Bonnet. In second place on the track is Buddy Baker, but he is a lap down. Daryl Waltrip did remain on the lead lap. He runs in the top 10, but he's in heavy traffic. There he is there with Jeff Bodine and Bill Elliott, and Dick Bergman has more on the Waltrip incident. Yeah, Larry, he definitely made contact with somebody. This is the tire that was on the left front of the car, and whoever made contact with has sort of a red and white paint job, because here it is. There was also a pretty good sized dent in the left rear corner of the car. Probably not the kind of thing that's really going to dramatically upset the balance of the chassis. Junior Johnson also went through the trouble of changing the wedge in the car, put a wrench inside, changed the amount of weight on the rear end of the car. Walter should run better now. Well, I guess if you had have somebody in your pits who could repair a race car on the spot at North Wilkesboro, it would be your first choice. I think Junior Johnson yeah. <laughs> would be the first choice. And you know, the reason for that is this has been a real tough racetrack to win at. When we started today's race, only four drivers who had entered this field had won here in the history of this racetrack. Only Darrell Waltrip, Richard Petty, Bobby Allison, and Tim Richmond had ever won here before, and there are only six teams entered who had won here. And the history of this racetrack, we mentioned to you earlier, more than 30 years. It's a tough racetrack. It is tough. Uh, the race cars get extremely, the surface gets extremely slippery, and the cars have trouble gripping the surface. Buddy Baker, who is not known as a short track driver, has the Valvoline Ford hooked up real well right now, Larry. Well, Buddy, remember, he's a lap down. He's a lap in four car lengths off of the lead lap. But with the new tires and whatever change the Wood Brothers made on that car during the last pit stop seemed to work because Baker's keeping pace with the leaders. There is Dale Earnhardt. Right now, Earnhardt runs in third place. This is really the first time we've been able to talk about Dale as an individual today. He's been in that group of cars running 8th through 15th, but suddenly, the man who won at Talladega earlier this year, he was the 1980 Grand National Champion. He's in the hunt, as Billy Waylu on bowling used to say. He is definitely in the hunt, Larry. Dale Earnhardt on the short tracks the last month of the season. There's trouble down in turn one. The L.D. Ottinger car, the number 98 car of Dr. Ron Benfield, showing a lot of smoke behind it as we looked up. He had spun, does not appear to be anything wrong mechanically with the race car. And you can see the North Wilkesboro stripe the North Wilkesboro <laughs> crunch that's showing up on the inside. We was talking about Dale Earnhardt a moment ago, Larry. The last month or so of the season, the short tracks that we've been to, the, the Richmonds and the Bristols and the Martinsville, Dale Earnhardt has really ran well. I've been very impressed with the rich job that Richard Childress and all of his guys have done on that Wrangler Chevrolet. I didn't expect it to run, to be a dominant force on the short tracks. The big tracks, yes, but not the short tracks. Uh, there you see the leader. It continues to be Neil Bonnet. People are now beginning to wonder, is this really going to be the day that a lot of people have waited for at last? Bonnet winning? And Harry Gant gets a horrible...
will start coming out of turn four. That's Earnhardt on the high side. Watch for the blue and yellow car. They're going at it for second place. There they go by. Gann on the inside in green and white. The yellow flag was for L.D. Ottinger spinning. He kept going, so he certainly did not lose any position in the racetrack. There is the leader, Neil Bonnet, with Buddy Baker one lap behind. But right now, watch him coming to the top part of your screen, side by side for second place. Eric Gant did get a horrible start. It's like he almost missed a shift or something. Dale Earnhardt's not going to let him go. He drives up alongside of him coming off turn two. You run out of racetrack right there, but they made it. Well, Benny, you had a chance to talk a little bit with Harry during the break. He made some comments about the race car and how it feels to him right now. Well, he said that his car was a little loose or losing the back end, trying to spin out earlier on. They adjusted it during the pit stop, and now the thing don't want to turn for him. It's what we call pushing. In the middle of the turn, it just does want to turn. He said they're going to have to spend the day working on it and trying to get it perfect for the last 100 laps or so. Now, again, has thwarted this recent challenge by Dale Earnhardt. Now, we're going to look at the restart again. Now, watch Harry again. He's about his third car in line. And we got a nice ISO of Harry. Here he is in the middle of turn number three, now between three and four. Petty goes by on the inside. Harry's not on the throttle. The green flag is out. <laughs> Here comes, looks like Dick Brooks on the inside. And on the outside is Earnhardt. That's the battle for position. Everybody goes, but, there, but Harry again, I don't know. Uh, maybe when he hit the throttle, there was a momentary pause, and their other car just drove alongside of him. I really don't know, Larry. Well, it continues to be... Neil Bonnet leading, Harry Gann is second, Dale Earnhardt is in third, Terry Labonte fourth, and Tim Richmond is in fifth position at this point. Well, Dale Earnhardt is one of the more exciting drivers in Grand National Racing, and he has one of the most veteran crew chiefs that he drives for, Richard Childress. We asked Richard, is it difficult to control Dale? Richard is crew chief, and team owner, and manager. Is it a tough job? holding on to Dale Earnhardt in terms of uh, holding him back maybe or controlling him? Well, not really. We, you know, we let Dale more or less run his own race out there, and uh, I just sort of manage a team, and Kurt Shemardine, he's the crew chief on the car, so uh, we've got a pretty good system worked out. You know, if he wants to know something, you know, kind of how the pace of the race is going or something, he'll talk to us, and if uh, we need to tell him something, we'll get back with him, but no, we, we haven't been holding him back, man. We've been going all out to try to win everywhere. You talk about two entire different individuals. That's Dale Earnhardt and Richard Childers. Richard is kind of a conservative. Dale, the extreme liberal. Uh, he really will try anything to get to the front. If it's backwards, that's exactly what he's going to do. But, Benny, that is also not to suggest that you'd want to control Dale Earnhardt because, as a matter of fact, the last couple of seasons, I have felt that Dale has become a better race driver. He's always been fast, but this year there have been some real minor tweaks in his personality on the racetrack, and I have a feeling he's probably in a better position now to start winning more regularly than what he was, say, two years ago. Oh, I think he's a much better racetrack right now than he ever was, and I, that's not to say that what he's doing is wrong because it is exciting and it gets him to the front. I mean, if his car is capable of winning, Dale Earnhardt is the guy that will win for you. One of my favorite things to do is to watch Dale Earnhardt at one of the big racetracks. Boy, he's entertaining. <laughs> Buddy Baker has really tacked on to the back bumper of Neil Bonnet. Baker's wishing he'd have discovered this setup when they dropped the green flag because he has been fast. Bear in mind, right now, there is the fastest car on this track, Neil Bonnet leading the red and white gold number of 12. And Buddy Baker, though a lap down, has stayed right there. Now, Baker will be leaving this team next year. Kyle Petty will be the Woods Brothers driver for 1985. And Buddy Baker seems to have a lot of options for himself, doesn't he? He seems to. I really don't know what Buddy's going to do, but uh, from what I gather, talking to Buddy and reading the newspaper, he has several places to go. He may even end up with a team that if it's not his own team that he has a great deal of control over, maybe more control than he's ever had in his career as far as running the actual team. I would also imagine that there are two or three other Grand National teams who are contemplating changes who've got to be talking to Buddy just to think about what their options might be with uh, Buddy Baker. I'm sure well, we that's talked true. to the Woods brothers about their situation, about what they might be doing the rest of this year and in 1985. Well, the reason we're here now is because uh, we're not in the top 25, and it would mean quite a bit of difference in, in money for next year if we run all the races to be in the top 25. So, you know, naturally it could mean $100,000 worth 
just for coming here and starting the race and finishing up to put us in the top 25. So uh, that's the reason we're here. So this protects your options. It's a possibility you might run all the races. Well, I think we will run all the races. Oh, it's more than a possibility. Kyle Petty is there. The Southland Corporation has brought 7-Eleven. Valvoline will be back next year. We don't know exactly where they're going yet. They'll be back, and the Woods Brothers will be present at all 30 events. You know, first it was Daryl Walter, but now it's Neil Bonnet. Neil is losing the handle, Larry. Harry Gant, he had a 15 car length stone a moment ago. Now Harry Gant is right on his bumper, and really and truly, it looks like Harry's going to be able to go by in just a few laps. Well, in every Grand National race, if you knew how long the green flag segment was going to be, what you would do, you'd set up for the end of that green flag segment because the track is going to change, the car is going to change. After all, it's not a conditioned athlete. It's a bunch of equipment and machinery. And the setup that you have when you first come out of the pits, you know it's going to be different. It might get faster, but it might get slower also. Well, that's exactly Neil Bonnet, when they threw the green flag, his, his setup was perfect. Now it's less than perfect. Harry Gantz seems to have the best setup right now. Or Buddy Baker. We well, certainly can't argue with the job that Baker's doing right now. As we watch the pugilism being ready to get set up for first place, quick rundown on where we are. We're about a quarter of a way through the race. It's Bonnet. He's been there for about 60 or 70 laps. There is the battle for third position right now. It's Bobby Allison on the inside. He moves up to third now, getting around Earnhardt. In second place is Harry Gantz. Fifth is Terry Labonte. Sixth is Ron Bouchard. Seventh is Richmond. And eighth is Waltrip. Dick Bergman has been watching what's going on from his vantage point in the pits. What you seeing down there, Dick? Well, we're certainly seeing an awful lot of close competition, but I'm especially watching Dale Earnhardt at this moment. Of late, he's had problems under the hood. Specifically, he blew the engine up in that car at Darlington, also at Charlotte. At Martinsville, they had engine problems. The crew says that's their major situation. They have got to get the engine squared away. They are now out trying to win races, essentially abandoning the point race. Yesterday, they went forward over where they've been here before. They expect to run very, very fast here today. They expect this engine is going to live. Well, they talked about abandoning the point battle, Larry. They didn't really abandon the point battle. It was blown engines that took them out of it. Yeah, it sure did. And you know something else that's happening, Benny, which is great for the spectators, not only here at the racetrack, but those of you watching at home. This race is suddenly wide open. Mentioned we're only a quarter of the way through. There's Harry Gann and the bandit going after Bonnet. Waltrip is not running away with this race like a lot of people thought he would. Allison, right now, he's the fastest car on the track, although Gant's being held up by Bonnet. Allison is on the prowl. Dale Earnhardt is competitive. He's less than a turn behind the first three cars. Labonte is still in it. This could be mighty exciting. And Ron Bouchard just passed Terry Labonte, so now he is really running. You're right, this race is wide open, and I just can't wait for the end. Bonnet, Gant, the first two cars. You know, we've had a lot of fun with the question of the week, and because this is our last race for the Grand National Cars, we ask everybody an unusual question. Bobby, more than anything else, what would you like to have for Christmas this year? Probably a key to Junior Johnson's shop. Well, I'd like for uh, Stevie now to be able to go to the Holy Land. So we've talked about it for a long time, and because of racing, we haven't had an opportunity to. But one of these days, come December, we're just going to pack up and we're going to go where the Lord walked one time. Well, my best Christmas present I could ever have is the guys up in the shop building me some new race cars to go out next year and win a bunch of races. Well, I don't want much. I just want a, I want a new van and a, a new twin-engine airplane and a new motorcycle. And uh, that's about it for right now. It's all I can stand on next year, but that'd be good enough. I'd, I'd have to say uh, I've, I've been really wanting to get a sauna for the for the back of the house. I think I'd enjoy that more than anything. Larry, I think I'd settle for the 1985 Winston Cup Championship. And I'd ask for it in advance for Christmas, I think. Well, uh, basically, I'd like to have a win in the Daytona 500. That's a lot to ask, but that's what I'd like to have. I guess it would be for SPN to sponsor me so I can go really go racing. How about that? You know, I get socks, underwear, and aftershave lotion, and these guys are asking for cars and planes and twin engine airplanes and quarter million dollar championships. Well, they first raced here in October of 1949. That was 35 years ago, and one of the mighty flocks won that race.
next Saturday, the 20th of October at noon Eastern Daylight Time, watch for the Gamecocks of South Carolina versus the mighty Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. It's been tough sled, talking about tough sled for the Fighting Irish in 1984. They've had an up and down season, but who knows? Will their Heisman hopeful, Alan Pinkett, who has come on strong lately, be able to outdo the fire ants, the famous defense of South Carolina? You'll know if you watch ESPN next Saturday. That's Warner Hodgson and his small son Justin watching the, their car, Neil Bonnet, go to the front, stay there all day. He's got some pretty serious competition. That's Justin watching things alongside his dad. He's become a real mainstay on this trail, Justin has. You know, that I see him more than I do his dad. And or Aaron, uh, the older son of, of Warner. By the There's way, just before we went. Rudd, uh, the Gatorade car, Rusty Wallace. And you know, the, the car on the outside, the five car, the red and white of Jeff Bodine has really been something I don't quite understand because that car hasn't been as competitive today as we thought it would be. There's a quick rundown on the top rookie drivers so far in terms of the points. Wallace, Bill Parsons, Greg Sachs, Clark Dwyer, and Tommy Ellis. It's really essentially down to between Phil and Rusty Wallace. Got to be pleasing for Phil because I think when the season began, the fact that Phil was not going to run as many races as what Rusty, plus the reputation that Wallace had in the short tracks, I think most people kind of assumed it would be a shoe-in for Wallace. Yeah, I think they did. But Phil's been, he's made a good account of himself. He has run extremely well. Bobby Allison tried to get alongside Neil Bonnet that time. That is Tim Richmond in the red gold trim number 27 being followed on the racetrack by Ricky Rudd, the Wrangler Jeans number 15, and Rusty Wallace in the Gatorade number 88. Right now they are running 8th, 9th, and 10th, and there is the battle for the number one position. Neil Bonnet goes to the high side of Jimmy Means, and he almost gave Bobby Allison enough room to make it three abreast. That's tough to do here. <laughs> but not quite. <laughs> Neil Bonnet's going to use all those slow cars to the best of his ability. Bobby Allison today, Larry, started 18th. Right now, he's trying to take the lead. Quite a charge in a little over 100 laps. While we watch these two guys go at it for first, just before we went to the last break, I mentioned one of the mighty flocks had won the very first race here ever. Now, you grew up not too far from here. Remember which one it was? Tim. Exactly right. I think it was Bob. I'm not sure. Well, in the first race that I ever saw here, a Grand National race, Tim Flock, Tim Flock won, won in the Chrysler 300. Oh, mighty well, cars, were they? Yes. They were about what, 13 football fields long, I think. Weren't they? But this Look track, at Bobby Allison, right on Neil's bumper. This track has been around a long time, and uh, it's been one of the most important home bases, I think, for Grand National Racing. You think of Grand National Racing, and this is one of the names that kind of pops into your mind. It was dirt back then when they they paved this racetrack in 1963. Bobby Allison is working over Neil Bonnet. Allison, who has won twice in 1984. Bonnet still looking for win number one. Bobby Allison, who I think truly expected to at least finish third in the point standings this year. I felt that uh, they assumed that they were the team to beat when the season began, but it just hasn't unfolded that way. And you know, Larry, right there is teacher and student. Neil Bonnet is the student of Bobby Allison, his protege. He is a member of the Alabama gang, Bobby Allison being the president, Donnie the vice president, and uh, Ron Bouchard, as we're seeing right now, Ron Bouchard on the screen is on the move. He passed Terry Labonte a moment ago. He's running down Dale Earnhardt, although Darrell Walker has passed Bouchard and has moved into fifth spot. Well, Bouchard has been consistent, fifth and sixth and seventh throughout this race. We are now about 140 laps in. Remember, we'll go 400. Bouchard appears to be, at least Jack Beebe and the Race Hill Farms team, appear to be right on the brink of perhaps landing their first major sponsorship. And you just wonder, with a few more thousand dollars every race, how good this team would be. They've been fast from time to time. They won that race at Talladega a few years ago. Had a great season in the late model sportsman. I think it's going to make a big difference if they get an influx of money. I think it is, Larry, because money, let's face it, money helps anything. And racing, you spend a great deal of money, and uh, the more you have to spend, basically the faster the car goes. Now Bouchard right now runs in sixth position, Walter having just gotten around. And even though first Harry Gant and now Bobby Allison were able to move in, and oh, Allison oh. out of shape. He touched fenders, I'm pretty sure, with Trevor Boys, the Canadian from Calgary, Alberta, as they came out of turn number four that time. 
They it's, definitely touched Fender's wire. That was very, very close for Bobby Allison. Uh, you know, the speeds aren't 200 miles an hour here, and they're a lot more forgiving. But you, you're lulled into a false sense of security watching it, particularly on television, because the cars only look like they're going 50 or 60 miles an hour, but we're well up in the vicinity of 100 miles an hour all the way around, maybe 130 at the end of the straightaways. And it doesn't take nearly as much as you might think to find yourself up against the cement, does it? It really does. And the thing is that the racing is so close that touching another car is all, getting around the racetrack without touching is almost impossible. Here, Bobby Allison is simply trying to lap the car, but he, Trevor Boys on the inside in the 48 car, the, the dark red car, is exactly where Bobby Allison wants to be. So Bobby brings his car down the hill for that group. They touch. I don't know. I, I think I would have sided a little bit with Trev on that one. Trev looked like he had a pretty straight line. Bobby's rear end came around. It got a little loose, and it kind of drew him right into Trevor Boys. Allison challenging for second. That cost him a few car lengths. He'll have a couple of laps now before he can catch back up to Neil Bonnet if he has any more aspirations of getting around Neil Bonnet. Well, the first set of pit stops are over. We should continue under this green flag and no pit stops as long as there are no incidents on the racetrack. Although the drivers get the majority of credit for winning a Grand National race, a lot of the credit really goes to the crews. Just ask the drivers and they'll tell you for sure. Right now, the crews on pit road are really worn out. The majority of these people haven't had a day off since Michigan. That was early August. It's a long time to go without a day off. They've run every single weekend in between. They're ordinarily at the racetrack three or four days, tow the rig home, work on it in the garage and back. And many of those days are 12 and 14 hours. And when the cars get done with this race, a lot of them are gonna look pretty beat up. I think we just like the crews. They're pretty beat up too right now. Grand National Racing has become so competitive that you have to be incredibly complete. A lot of the parts that uh, may look like standard production parts to you are specially made for Grand National Racing. And that includes even a lot of the things that are used not on the race car, but in the pit area. This track pack is a jack fat. And every jack that is used during the running of a race in a Grand National race is custom tailor-made by the team that's going to use it. Take, for instance, this one. The traditional wheels up front have been replaced with a roller. It makes it move a lot easier. The sides, which originally were steel, are now aluminum, makes it lighter in weight. This handle has been added for ease of carrying, if indeed 60 to 70 pounds is easy. These holes drilled here further reduce the weight. The handles are often custom-made. Sometimes they're bent so that the crewman who wields this jack feels comfortable with it. And the cylinder on the inside down here is changed so that a jack that might normally take 11 pumps to elevate to its highest point could perhaps be as little as just five pumps. The interesting thing about these jacks really are the people operate them. Though they weigh about 70 pounds, a good Grand National jack man can wield this thing around as if it were no heavier than, say, a George Brett baseball bat. History at North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, in addition to Bob Clock and Fondy Clock, Herschel McGriff won here on dirt, Dick Rathman, a previous winner, Buck Baker, Speedy Thompson, Herb Thomas, and those fabulous Hudson Hornets. Today could be Neil Bonnet's day, back after this. Back at the North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, nestle among the painter's palette here in the fall, the mountains and the hillsides of the Brushy Mountains erupt in color, reds and golds and greens, and of course the fir trees that are here, they stay green year round, and it's just gorgeous, just about every color except sky blue, and of course on a day like today, that's even a part of the picture, and it really is a very nice place to come and watch a race this time of the year. Well, I grew up here, Larry, and I remember in the fall that being my favorite time of the year with all the color change. About another week from now, it will probably be the most gorgeous place in the earth. There's Jeff Bodine. Now, Bodine practiced very fast two weeks ago. He qualified near the front. He was the fourth starter in today's race. Things look normal, the first 20 laps, but the last 50 to 60 laps, he has been slipping backwards. And Dick Bergman has hustled on down to the all-star pit to find out what's going on with Jeff. Larry, sometimes you have to be able to stop in order to go fast. And Bodine's problem is brakes. Early in the race, he apparently got him a little bit too hot and as a result, they've gone away somewhat. He doesn't have the brake that he'd like to have, so he's got to leave himself a lot of room between him and other cars. And the brakes will come back as this event unfolds, but they'll never be quite as good as they should be. Bodine, brake problems. 
you know, I'll have to agree that is a big problem to run without brakes because I have tried that at Martinsville several times. It is very, very difficult. And they will come back. That's true. But Jeff Bodine right now is two laps down. And to make up two laps on a, a Neil Bonnet or Harry Gann as well as they're running today is going to be very difficult. It looks like Bodine's got a long day in front of him. Their sponsor, Northwestern Life, has done an early, an interesting thing. That's Jeff Bodine's sponsor. They put a different insurance agent's name on the tail of the car each race. And the one that's on the car this week, Lennox Insurance out of Kentucky, earlier today, I was being told by the, the people involved with Northwestern Life, Bob Adams in particular, that the agency was worth about $20,000 a month in business prior to Northwestern's life getting involved in automobile racing. And now they've increased their business by about tenfold. So racing has really contributed to the business direct. That's great. Well, Bonnet continues to lead, but here comes a familiar face. I think we've seen that number 11 before, and he hasn't been spectacular in the last 20 laps, but he's on the ball. He is on the move. He was alongside Dale Earnhardt a moment ago, and they got alongside a slow car, and Earnhardt used the slow car as a pick. Darrell had to back off, but Darrell is on the move. But they better hustle because, you know, Neil Bonnet is, is simply driving away. He's got about a half a lap on Neil right, on Darrell right now. And Darrell certainly don't want his teammate to beat him. Well, Bonnet has had an open track, really, for most of the last half hour, whereas Darrell has been in heavy traffic. And Darrell has been moving up slow but sure. Still a long ways to go. By the way, the cars are expected to pit between laps 235 and 240. And uh, right now we're at 162, so without any more caution flags, we're probably going to go up another 70 laps or so before the people duck into the pit. There's still a long ways to go, and as long as you're on the lead lap and running fairly competitive, it can be anybody's race, and we certainly saw that in the spring. Oh, that's exactly right. It's anybody's race. Uh, the guys that are a lap down, now they're the ones that have the problem because now they have to have caution flags to be able to get those laps back because somebody like Buddy Baker, if he were to pass Neil Bonnet, I just don't think that he can make up a whole lap on the lead car. 11 cars continue on the lead lap, and Allison continues to hound Bonnet. He pounds away on that back bumper. You know, you say that metaphorically at Talladega, but here when you say pound, chances are you really mean it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I thought a moment ago when I saw Bobby Allison start from off the corner that the front bumper was bent like he had hit someone. And the only guy I've seen him close to <laughs> is Neil Bonnet, so I wouldn't doubt if they haven't touched a couple of times. Well, you know, at this point of the season, they both want to win. There was a time when maybe you might think that Allison might be a little lenient on his protege because when the number 12 car of Bonnet first came up into the league, and Allison now looks like he's got the advantage, Benny. Oh, there's a race going every place right now. The fans just, they don't know who to cheer for because Bobby Allison, Neil Bonnet, on the other side of the racetrack, Darrell Walter, and they'll earn, they'll earn our side by side. There's a race every place right now, Larry. But this is the battle for the lead. The Hueytown gang is side by side, at least 50% of the Hueytown gang. There they go at it. Benny, you mentioned it earlier. Teacher and student. Teacher on the inside, student on the high side. You can see the white gloves of Neil Bonnet. Uh, he is at work. He is at work. Three abreast. No, Bobby has to fall back. Well, Jeff Hooker, the young driver out of the ARCA ranks who qualified for the race here, here this he weekend. Comes back. Allison keeps the momentum up, lurking just ahead of them is Kenny Schrader. Schrader having his mirrors filled with these two outstanding Grand National drivers. Now, right now, they're side by side, but Bonnet has the advantage. Look at all the room he gave Allison. Neil Bonnet gave Bobby Allison momentarily enough room. Enough room for the three cars. But Bobby was afraid that Schrader in the 64, being a rookie, would not realize that he wanted to go three abreast. And why eliminate himself 170 laps into the race? I feel like that was a very, very smart move on Bobby Allison's part. And quite a, he's alongside of him again. Quite a gesture, really, on Bonnet. Bonnet is racing right now. He's working, but he's also having a good time. Look at Jeff Bodine commented on him a few minutes ago. Bodine's really out to lunch as far as the setup goes today. And boy, Jeff, they really anticipated being competitive, but it's just not come together for him. Well, the brakes, you know, he, and Jeff has to run that high line because he can't let anybody on the outside of him because when he goes in the corner and don't have any brakes, he has to, if there's a car on the outside of him, he may hit that car. He's run on the outside, so the only thing he's going to hit is the wall. I think it's pretty nice move on Jeff Bodine's part. Yeah, it really is. Jeff Bodine, you know, he's always been fast. He's always been spectacular, and looks like he's in store for a nice, long, grand national career. Pretty obvious he's fast here, too. Well, we had some exciting racing going there a moment ago. 
a further report, we're watching the Neil Bonnet and Bobby Allison battle, but Darrell Walter did make it by Dale Earnhardt a moment ago and has put a 10 car links on Dale. Neil Bonnet in the middle of the screen there. They're moving up to put a lap on the King, Richard Petty. Allison looks to the inside one more time. Oh, I was going to do some commenting about Bonnet, but it looks like that battle is going to heat back up again. He may have the line this time, Benny. Allison may have it. I think he does. they might touch. Bad spot coming off that second corner. Oh, they, they do touch. Didn't they touch? Boy, it sure looked like it. Whatever it was, I tell you, Bonnet headed for the hills. He got out of there, that's for sure. Oh, the people are loving it. Side by side. Bonnet says it's not going to be that easy, though. Oh, my goodness. Penny is holding his own up there. Both of them a little loose going through turn one, turn two, down the backstretch. Richard Petty is going to hold up on it just a little bit, and they both fishtail down the backstretch. Boy, you couldn't get much closer than that. I'd hate to be between those two cars. And Bonnet sliding out just a little bit that time as they came out of turn number four, downhill. Allison on the inside uses the momentum, and for the first time today, Bobby Allison leads by our unofficial count, our fourth leader, number 12, Daryl Waltrip leading the first 37 laps. Levante then assumed control. Neil Bonnet has been there a long time since lap number 80. And now Bobby Allison, 95 laps later, lap 175, becomes the fourth leader of the race. Quite a remarkable charge, Larry. The man started 18th and now has the lead in 175 laps. My hat's off to him. That's getting the job done. Bobby Allison, who... A year ago here was third when he was in the midst of the drive to the championship. His best finish in 1984 has been first. He's been there twice. In his career starts, he has won 81 times. And in the last two or three years, it has been Gary Nelson who has been leading Bobby Allison to victory. Gary, things seem to be going very well for you. Are you holding anything back or running as hard as you can? Well, Bobby's shoulder is still giving him a lot of trouble, so I think he's got a little left in him for the end. We're very pleased with the way the car's running, uh, you know, but the way our season's gone so far, we're going to wait till the last lap to see where we are then. When will you make your next pit stop, Gary? Well, we're going to we're gonna watch. We're gonna, we know we can go farther on gas than we can on tires. You know, the tires, the, the speed drops off as the tires get hotter. So uh, we're going to let a couple of top cars make their stops. We'll see how much speed they pick up, whether they change two or four tires, then we'll make our decision there. So we really, we don't have uh, an exact time we're going to stop yet. Very complicated pit strategy here in Bobby Allison's pit. A Back mainstay on the... at every Grand National stock car race, the King Richard Petty. And this is a racetrack which in the early years of his career was very kind to him. He has won 15 times here at North Wilkesboro. He's had a long and colorful career, and earlier this season, we had a nice conversation with Richard about his career. This is another STP pit stop, and I'm Larry Newber. You know, crashes for a major league professional automobile racing driver is not something that he likes to concentrate on, but it is something that is part of the profession. Richard Petty has had a lot of successes, but he also has had the crashes that all those drivers like to, of course, try and avoid. Richard, which one sticks out in your mind more than all the others? Well, probably the one in 1970 at Darlington, South Carolina. You know, I've had a lot of wrecks and a lot of spectacular wrecks, but I think this was probably uh, the most spectacular as far as looking at it. And uh, uh, I dislocated his shoulder. What I did, I run into the wall on the outside, hit the wall on the inside, and the car turned over six or seven times, rolled down in front of the grandstand, the whole works, you know, and uh, dislocated his shoulder. And that's the only time that I've ever been hurt in a race car where I couldn't drive the next race. So, uh, you know, for me, then uh, I got to remember that. One. The sport can also be very rewarding, but also cruel. We lose friends in automobile racing accidents. You lose races, cars break down at the wrong time. Biggest disappointment, what sticks out in your mind? Well, that's hard to say. Uh, you know, after running for 25 years, I've had a lot of disappointments. Uh, you know, I can think about uh, maybe losing a race, uh, you know, because of some stupid mistake you made and stuff like that. But the thing that really probably uh, on my mind right now is probably Daytona two years ago when you know, we felt like we had way the best car and we drove off and left everybody. And, uh, you know, even though we'd done that Daytona before, this was the one that I really thought 
And I'd, I'd sit down and thought about it, and I, I knew that if we finished the race, we was going to win. And it was just a big disappointment because I got too high for that particular race. Richard, victories. We are at 200 and still counting. Is there any way that you can single out one as the most memorable in your long career? Well, I, you know, all of them were memory at the time. Uh, you know, the, a lot of them got lost in uh, the deal of, of being so many of them, then you don't remember them that much. But right now, you'd have to say that the 200th was, uh, was the very best. Uh, July the 4th, the President of the United States uh, in attendance. Uh, my racing with Kale, who won the last couple of three races at Daytona. Me beating him by, you know, two or three foot on the last lap. Uh, you know, the whole thing put together was was a big, big race. But with everything put together, it's going to be a memory for a long time for me and a lot of racing people. Okay, Richard, what are you going to do for an encore now? <laughs> well, we're going to we're going to win two of one and go from there. But uh, I don't know if we'll ever top that one or not. Uh, I didn't. I've won some at Daytona and some of the other racetracks I thought never would be topped, and then we come back July the fourth and top that one. So. Uh, I guess there's still something out there that we can do that's bigger than that. Thanks, Richard. This has been another STP Pit Stop. I'm Larry Newber. And at 5 o'clock Eastern Time, join us for live coverage of the Stroh's 150 IndyCar race from Phoenix International Raceway. In case you've just joined us, this is Grand National Stock Car Racing from North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. The leader is Bobby Allison. Neil Bonnet, who dominated much of this race, is second. Harry Gant is third. Daryl Waltrip, also a leader earlier this afternoon, is fourth. And Dale Earnhardt, running a consistently fast race, is in fifth. Ricky Rudd, he dominated here in the spring, is sixth. Ron Bouchard, seventh. Terry Labonte, the points leader, is eighth. Rusty Wallace, leading up the rookie standings, is ninth. And Bill Elliott, tenth. Those are the only cars, the only 10 cars on the lead lap, but a close 11th to the lead lap is Tim Richmond. Terry Labonte, the blue and white Piedmont Airlines sponsored race car, right now leads the point standings and he also leads in the number of miles competed. That certainly is a factor in striking up a lot of points. Everybody has a different philosophy about the points championship and we've had a crash in the inside of turn number four. It's Tim Richmond. And Benny, he hit a very vulnerable place on this track, didn't he? Oh, he really did. He hit oh. oh, and he's almost into crew members coming down pit road there. Richmond apparently a little angry about something that happened on the racetrack. He roars into his pit, slides to a stop, and Tim Brewer and crew go to work on the old Milwaukee number 27. Oh, a little bit of tense uh, uh -huh. moments there. Those people are not going to watch the race from there anymore, I'll tell you. I, uh, I kind of thought the left rear tire was flat, but we're, we're looking at the left side right now, and it's, it does look to be flat. But he really did the job on that big tire. He looked like Bill Fralick from the University of Pittsburgh trying to clear out the linebackers for a run for a second. Richmond really getting on the throttle. He hit at the entrance to the pits where there's a big tire that has been covered with cement. And it's pretty healthy and it's right, right solid, isn't it? That's right. But he was off the racing service, so we did not have a caution play. If some of the viewers watching are wondering why the cars aren't slowing down, he was on pit road and and got the car moving again, and there was not a caution play. Well, Tim had just been lapped by the leaders, Bobby Allison and Neil Bonnet. Remember back in 1980 when Tim Richmond took the Indianapolis 500 by storm when he qualified well into the top 10 in terms of speed? He had been the fastest practicer all month long back in 1980. Spent a couple of years in Indy cars and then came south, first with D.K. Ulrich. He had quite a number of rides before he landed with the, the J.D. Stacy team and last year hooked up with Raymond Beadle. There you see Tim. Now, Benny, tell us what's going on here. Well, he's trying to get going down the pit road, but the car gets a little bit too far out of shape, and he has to straighten it up or spin out. And, oh, guy said, what's he doing? Now, one guy threw a can at him as he went by. <laughs> Uh, I think the car would have hurt worse than a can, though. Yeah, lots of differences of opinion, I'm sure, about that particular incident. But no harm, no foul, I guess. No one was struck. And uh, I guess the positive point there, Richmond was going all but 15 miles an hour, at least at yeah. that very moment. He really wasn't going that fast. So but, Richmond. You know, Gary Nelson a moment ago mentioned that they were going to wait for some of the other cars to pit and change four tires. And they wanted to see just how much speed they picked up when they changed four tires. Well. Tim Richmond does then change four tires. So everybody on pit road now, Larry, is clocking, is timing that 27 car to see how fast he's moving. Now they hope that a front runner pits, 
and gets two tires because they want to time him and see what the difference is. Well, Dick Bergman has made his way down to the Tim Richmond, Tim Brewer crew chief pit. Dick has some more information on that Richmond story. And I'm, with, I'm with Tim Brewer. Tim, what exactly happened up there with your car? I ain't got no idea. You know, I don't know if he had some trouble getting in a pit area or what. He just hit the inside wall. Hell, I don't know what happened. How bad is the car? Well, we were just good enough. We figured we could come in and get four tires ahead of the rest of the guys, bring them back out and make the lap up. But that little incident up there, hell, it put us far behind. It's going to be hard to catch up now. That's Tim Brewer. He and Tim Richmond will be playing catch up this afternoon. Well, Benny, the importance about a pit stop is not just the time that you spend at a stop in your pit stall, but how long you spend slowing down on the racetrack. This is a point that you made. And it's possible that Richmond was just trying to come in as quickly as he possibly could. I would think that's probably true, Larry. Bobby Allison continues to lead. He has just put a lap on Bill Elliott, one of the top four contenders for the points lead. Bonnet runs second, Gann is third, and Waltrip runs in fourth. Driving the Skull Bandit. It ain't easy. Even in practice. What's it like using Skull Bandits? That's real easy. Skull Bandits is tobacco in a neat little pouch. You don't chew it. Just put one between your cheek and gum and enjoy the refreshing taste. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing. It's that easy. Try Skull Bandits. We think you'll agree. It's a little pouch of pleasure. His favorite race driver, or her, excuse me, Sissy's favorite race driver, is Daryl Waltrip. There's a reason why she's at the base of the Budweiser truck. Sissy belongs to Daryl and Stevie Waltrip. The leader is Bobby Allison. He has just put the points leader for the 1984 well, season. Trouble in turn Right in front of the leaders, Allison and Bonnet. Up against the wall is Ottinger. And the number 17 of Lake Speed, the yellow will come out. Watch for everybody to pit. Allison avoided that incident and occurred right directly in front of first and second place. Everybody will be darting into pit road now as Ottinger and Lake Speed have stopped between turns three and four. L.D. Ottinger, of course, who has moved into this car with the removal of Joe Rutman. A lot of people anticipate a change. They didn't expect it this soon, and Ottinger's in trouble here. Well, he and Lake Speed, or, yes, Lake Speed in the 17th, somehow got together. I don't know exactly what happened, but we see them both backing towards the fence. Ottinger hits it. Lake Speed does not make any contact with the fence, maybe a little bit of contact with the 98 car of Ottinger, but there's no damage to the 17 other than just superficial but there may be some damage to the 98 car. We'll have to wait until he gets back on the racetrack. There is the leader, Bobby Allison, the Miller High Life Buick. They have re-upped with Buick. Bobby will be back in a Buick next year, despite the fact that a lot of the teams which ran Buicks a couple years ago have changed. They've been very loyal to the Buick mark, and they'll be back in 85 with the same car. Allison has been the dominant force here for the last 30 or 40 laps of this race. He has a fairly efficient pit stop. It looks like he he's wins. first. He's the first of the leaders getting out of the pits. You saw Neil Bonnet steering around Tim Richmond. Richmond really hoped to get out first. He really needed to get out ahead of Allison, but it didn't happen. Trevor Boy's getting out in pretty fine order, and so did that other red and white car. Darrell Walter had an excellent pit stop. He did beat Harry Gant out of the pits that time. He's now in third spot. Well, here are the leaders, Allison and Bonnet approaching turn number three. That's Ottinger right in front in speed. Ottinger getting a little bit out of shape going into turn number three. Smoke at the bottom of the screen. Well, we saw Ottinger, he was the car just prior, to the, the last car that we saw. He started to go underneath the Lake Speed, the number 17 car driven by Lake Speed. And as he did that, he kind of lost the car. It looked like went up and touched Lake Speed and out they went. See, there's just superficial damage to the 17 car. I don't think there's going to be any problem there. Benny All they are, they are seem to be working on the left rear of the car, beating the quarter panel out. Goes Rusty Wallace out of the pits. Rusty's had a good race. He's running in ninth position. Just about five laps before this yellow, he was lapped. So he's still in the top ten, but he's now a lap down, but still the highest ranking rookie in today's race. We're back with more green flag and more Bobby Allison and Neil Bonnet after this. He's continuing to win the war, the long Grand National Point Season War. There he is on the screen, the Piedmont Airlines car. There's a graphic showing you those who have improved and those who have eroded a little bit in terms of their performances from 84 to 83. Labonte 
to this point in the season this is by the way obviously making the biggest jump and Waltrip who was second a year ago this time back in fifth but you can see where all the various drivers were one year ago to this particular race. Labonte has had a real consistent season. They haven't won a lot of races. Waltrip is the league leader in that category again. But Terry Labonte and Dale Inman have proven to be a very competent racing team. And they have put together a couple of runs this season where they've gone eight or nine races in a row, finishing in the top four with consistency. And it's really paid off in the points championship. There are essentially five people who have a mathematical chance at the points championship. And everybody is approaching it just a little differently. Labonte certainly in the best position. All he really has to do, Benny, it seems, is finish in the top ten in the four remaining races, and he should win the championship. But finishing the top ten is a problem. Yeah, it's not an easy thing to do in this day and age in Grand National Stock Car Racing. Back to green, the yellow flag for the L.D. Ottinger Lake Speed incident. It was our fifth caution flag of the day. Make that the fourth caution flag of the day, and all of them have been for minor incidents. We've lost nobody because of a serious crash, and none of the leaders have dropped out of the race because of serious mechanical problems. Terry Labonte, the points leader. How are you going to handle it from here, Terry? There are all types of different philosophies about what do you do when you're in this position? Do you protect the points lead? Do you go after for wins? Let the points fall where they may? How are you going to handle it, Terry? You know, the other contenders we've talked to, they all feel as though they have to win. It's almost win at all costs. Is your strategy a little different? Well, ours right now has to be a little bit different. You know, we have to finish right now. We have to be a little cautious. Uh, we really can't take any unnecessary chances. We can't try anything new. We have to go with, with what we know works and, uh, uh, you know, be a little cautious, too. Terry Labonte continues in the top 10, but he has been lapped. Labonte is one lap down and runs in ninth position. Harry Gant, his closest adversary in the points championship, is still very much in it for victory here today. He's in fourth position in the race, not only on the lead lap, but he's only five car lengths out of first place. As Allison leads the race, you see him going down the backstretch, leading the chain gang there. Neil Bonnet is second. He's second on your screen. Darrell Waltrip is third. Ditto on the screen. Then comes Labonte, a lap down. Bill Elliott, a lap down. And the green car on the tail of the tandem of that quintet there, the number 33, Harry Gant. The first four cars in the race are in that group of six that you're watching. There's Jeff Bodine. Our spotters are on the speedway noticing smoke coming out of Bodine's car as he goes through the corners, but it's probably Benny. He needs to scuff off speed by sliding the car. He doesn't have any brakes. Yeah, that's probably true. He probably is sliding the tires. It's probably a tire smoke that we're seeing. No, I don't know. Well, no. it is. It's tire rubbing the left rear quarter panel. Probably on this restart, as close as the cars are, there's someone has, they've touched and knocked the left rear quarter in on his tire. Gives a whole new meaning to the word stagger, though, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Look at this battle for the front. This caution flag did one thing. It made a super race out of this thing. Well, Harry Ginn is right now second in points. He's 86 points behind Terry Labonte. He has got to finish at least as far ahead as Terry as possible for every race. His philosophy all year long has been a little different about the points. There are a couple of different philosophies when you're in the position you're at. Go for the championship, which sometimes means holding back a little bit, or go out for victory. Where do you guys stand? We go out for victory because the championship, you know, you can win it or you can lose it. And, uh, of course, you can in a race, too, but I, we, we try to win each race, day by day or race by race, and we don't worry about the points or anything, the Winston Cup points. We just run for the win this race. Now, Benny, you and I know that Hal Needham may be a little more interested in points than Harry, but i got to tell you, I, I really put Harry up for it. That's a stand he's had all year long, and they have combined speed with consistency probably better than any other team. Labonte's been consistent, not always a threat every single race to win, but this team has been the best combination, I think, of speed and consistency. They probably have, but, you know, as the season wear down, for the next two months, Harry Ginn is going to hear more about points that, than he ever had in his life. He and Labonte almost got together there a moment sure ago, slowed Harry down. Bill Elliott drove up on the outside of him. Well, Dick Bergman has also been with us for every one of these ESPN Grand National Stock Car Races. Dick, you and I have differed on opinions about different things in Grand National Stock Car Racing before. What about the Terry Labonte and Harry Gant philosophies? 
Well, I really like the, the philosophy that Gant is taking of go for it, but I really also think that if Bush came to shove, if it was a matter of losing the championship or taking a chance on winning a race, probably he would do some cruising. In fact, I'll almost guarantee it. Uh, Hal Needham, no matter what he's liable to tell you, and Harry Gant, no matter what he's liable to tell you, absolutely treasure this championship. Needham, in fact, is so pumped up about it that less than an hour before the race, he said to me, I think we're going to get it. I really, really don't. But even if we don't, we'll have no regrets. It's been a wonderful season for us, and indeed it has. They've had three wins this year. Needham also, Benny, tells us he's very close to putting together another team for Grand National Stock Car Racing this year. Not talking about a team car. We're not talking about a second car to the Skull Bandit 33 garage. A completely new team, and it's well documented. He's very interested in Tim Richmond. He really is. He, he wants Tim Richmond as a driver, thinks that he would be a good driver for his operation, and he probably would. Now there's Bill Elliott. You can see that Elliott's setup is just not what he would like it to be. We've had a change for second place, by the way, while we've been watching this Terry Gant, Terry Labonte, Bill Elliott situation. That's the points battle. Just to let you know, Waltrip now runs second. Bill Elliott, eh, a lot of people knew that he would be competitive for the points, but I think he may have surprised a few people as to how consistently fast he has been all year long. What about the points for you, Bill? Bill, at this point, it looks like Labonte and Gant really have a tremendous advantage. How do you view that? Well, Labonte's going to be virtually impossible to beat unless he has some tremendous bad luck because there's only four races left to go now. And, and I don't foresee him the, with the luck he's had to lie several races. All he's got to do is just finish the ones from here on out. He'll be in good shape. Well, Harry Gant says, if we win the championship, great. I want to win every race. Terry Labonte says, we're definitely completely occupied with the point situation. We drive every race to get points. And Bill Elliott says, we've conceded. Now, I don't mean to put words in his mouth, but he feels as though that he'd have to be incredibly lucky to win. The other guy who's close is Darrell Waltrip, and he has an altogether different philosophy than the other three. Now, people like you and me, the so-called experts, I did say so-called, okay, yeah, right. <laughs> We have counted Daryl Waltrip in fourth and Dale Earnhardt in fifth out of it. But you know, Daryl Waltrip, he always has a very unique opinion. He always feels very strong about his team and himself. And you gotta say that Daryl Waltrip has delivered during most of his career. So we asked Daryl, Daryl, you know, where do you stand in this point then? You think you still got a chance? Darrell, this is the first time in quite a number of years that you get down to this point in the season and you're not really a prime contender for the championship. How you feel? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little disappointing ever since 1979. Well, really, 1978, uh, I've been a factor in the, in the Winston Cup, and uh, right now being as far behind as I am, I, uh, I can only say that I feel personally that I will be, but before the season ends and I'll be back in it. I don't know why I feel that way other than I always have been and I can't imagine that I won't be. But I believe, even though I'm way out of it at this point, I still think I'll be something to deal with at Riverside. At this point, is your strategy simply, simply you gotta win every race, is that all it is? Yeah, it's no different than it ever was, really. We were far behind a, a week ago and uh, we're a little further behind this week. And we gotta go out and run hard and win. Hopefully everything will hang together and what happened last week won't happen again and we can pull it off. I, I think I can do it. You know, Larry, earlier on the broadcast, we saw what Darrell Walter wanted for Christmas. He wanted he and Stevie to go to the Holy Land and walk on the land that the Lord walked on. If he wins this championship, he ought to go <laughs> because there was more than Darrell Walter for Junior Johnson that because it will be a major miracle, folks, if he wins the thing. And, you know, I got to agree with Bill Elliott that is that he more or less does concede that Terry Labonte and Harry Gant, I mean, how is the, is the winner going to come from any other place than those two spots? Well, just to give you an idea, Harry Gant in second has to outfinish Terry Labonte over the last four races by a sum total of 23 positions. That's about five positions higher every race with consistency for the second place man to become champion. But today he's going to do it. If, if we was to stop the race right now, he would do it because Terry Labonte is about eighth spot. Harry Gant is fourth. Harry Gant has led the race, although Terry Labonte did lead the race. But that's about 15 or 20 points, and he's only 86 behind. Well, it's beginning to look like 
1983, 1982, and 1981 all over again. It's Allison leading, Waltrip running in second. Waltrip's teammate, Neil Bonham, is third. They ruined the good old dirt of North Wilkesboro, I guess some people might have thought at the time, back in 1957. And Jack Smith became the first winner after they paved it. Since that time, people like Daryl Waltrip, Richard Petty, Bobby Allison, Cale Yarborough, Tim Richmond, some guy by the name of Parsons have won here. I don't think that was Johnny, junior or senior. Well, a week from today, if you're interested in Indy cars or road racing, you'll certainly want to tune into Laguna Seca, the Laguna Seca 300 featuring the Indianapolis cars. I'll be there along with Bob Jenkins, of course, and Gary Lee, one of the final races of the 1984 season for the Cart Indy cars. They, too, have a tremendous battle going on for the season's championship. Looks like it's going to be either Mario Andretti or Tom Sneva, and they're going head-to-head, -head, not only next Sunday, but also this Sunday, and both of those races will be on ESPN. Well, here at North Wilkesboro, it's Allison and Waltrip. Well, how many times have we said those two names back to back in the last <laughs> many, few years? Many, many times in the last few years. It really has been. And the Winston Cup for the last three years has been a shootout between Darrell Waltrip and Bobby Allison. Darrell was the victor, was the winner twice. Bobby Allison was the winner last year. This year, both of them are out of it. Yeah, it's a change, but I guess for a lot of fans, it's kind of a refreshing change. There are an awful lot of fans who follow Bobby Allison and Waltrip, but some of the other people are getting a chance to holler this year. Phil Taylor, he's had a tough day, hasn't oh, he? He's, he <laughs> almost I? lost it right there. Car is extremely loose. Am I going to be in trouble for calling him Phil Taylor? you got to yes. explain that one, Benny. If he's got a VCR, you do. You <laughs> I won't tell him, but if he has a unit. But he is extremely loose. The car is just trying to lose the back end. He's running high, trying to grip a new racetrack. You see, oh, there's trouble right behind him. It's Tim Richmond again, and Richmond had just unlapped himself about 25 laps ago. He was running faster than the leaders, Allison and Waltrip, and now Richmond spinning in turn four again. He's dangling something behind him. Some... I tell you, Tim Richmond cut in the mold of Dale Earnhardt, Danny Ongaius. Tim Richmond definitely will stand on the gas, and Benny, he was simply trying to go as hard as he could, trying to catch up. I think he lost like two laps when he had his problem uh, oh, about 40, 50 laps ago. He had picked up one of them. He was trying to get all the way around and maybe get back on the lead lap. Tell you what, Bobby Allison was, was consistent in one of the past, was leading the race, and Darrell Walter was not gained on him. But yet, Tim Richmond, you're right, Larry, Tim Richmond had driven away from Bobby Allison. He was the fastest car on the racetrack at the moment when he spun. Dick Bergman is down in the pits for this flurry of pit stops. Dick. Yeah, Richmond's got himself a problem underneath the left rear corner. Some of the brake ducting is gone there. We can see that there's been contact on the left-hand side of the car. The left tires are all whited out. Richmond, not a happy man as he sits in this car. Well, Tim Richmond, who is thinking long and hard about the 1984 season, Daryl Waltrip and Bobby Allison were side-by-side -side coming out of the pits. And, Benny, what happened was... Daryl Waltrip just pushed Neil Bonnet off the jack. Is that a fact? I know they were very close, and I saw them side by side at one moment. He touched Neil Bonnet. He was pitting right behind Neil Bonnet, and as he tried to drive out, the left front corner of his car hit the bumper on Neil's car and knocked it off the jack. And it cost Neil one, two, three, four, five, six car positions on the racetrack. Now, he lost two positions in terms of the standings. Earnhardt gets out in third. Harry Gant gets out in fourth, and Bonnet is now fifth. Let's look at this again, Benny. Well, there, Bobby Allison has won. You see right there, he touches the car. And the car comes down. And the car, he knocks it off the jack. And Allison gets out first. He goes back into the lead, and Waltrip will come out right behind Bobby Allison, and he holds second position. Well, the thought that I, the, I'm not concerned about Neil Bonnet losing all those spots, but what right now is, is the left side tires tight? 
In other words, when the car fell down without the lug nuts being tightened, did it slip off center? And when they tighten the nuts down, did they tighten it against the rim rather than in the groove where it's supposed to go? Well, we've had eight. We, we continue to have eight cars in the lead lap. We've had six lead changes among five drivers. And this is our fourth caution flag. Less than 20 laps under caution here at North Wilkesboro. We'll be back with at least 100 more laps after these words. We just went back to green. Tim Richmond is to the left of your screen. Two laps down. Now one and about seven eighths of a lap. The leaders are Allison in the white 22. Waltrip in the white and red top number 11. In third place is Dale Earnhardt. And Earnhardt is mounting a challenge for the first time today. Dale Earnhardt says, hey, boys, I got something in that last pit stop. I want to lead this race. I ain't been there yet today. Darrell Walter tried to get by Bobby Allison on the inside, and when he did, it left nobody for Dale oh, Earnhardt. Earnhardt sliding around number four. Oh, he almost lost it on the outside. That doesn't seem to be the place to be. The cars seem to get extremely loose up on the outside of that racetrack. Well, Harry Gann is in fourth. Remember, he's second in the point standings. And he's in a great position to pick up a lot of points on Labonte, who right now is about ninth or tenth and a lap down, and Gant gets underneath Earnhardt. Earnhardt maybe fried him just a little too hot going high the, on the corners, Benny. He probably got his tires just a little bit hot when he spun the rear tires as he did exit turn four. Neil Bonnet, who has dominated, he and Bobby Allison has dominated this race. Neil Bonnet right now is in about six spots. Bad pit stop, he's way back right now. And also Allison now and Waltrip are getting underneath Richmond. And the two abreast start with the lap cars on the inside. Richmond got his lap back, but it only lasted two or three laps. Now they're getting underneath, and Tim pulling to the high side, letting the leaders go by. Meanwhile, Neil Bonin, who Benny just alluded to, is out of your screen. He's trying to get back up near the front. He's been fast all day, but it's Allison, Waltrip, Harry Gant, Dale Earnhardt, and Neil Bonnet, the top five, and in that order. And running in sixth position at this point, Scratch that. The number 15 car of Ricky Rudd is also still up among leaders. And now Waltrip gets to the inside of Allison. Boy, this is going to bring the fans oh, to their feet. Oh, they are on their feet. He takes the lead going in turn three. Remember that Daryl Waltrip and everybody in the grandstands is up. They got something to say. Remember that Daryl Waltrip spun about 100 laps into this race going down the backstretch. He was able to get the car fired back up again. He got back out into the speedway before he was lapped. The caution flag came out. He pitted in sync with all the other leaders. And finally, it's taken about 200 laps. But Waltrip is back. He is back in front. But this seems to be the way it's been all day, Leg. On a restart, Bobby Allison's car does not seem to be dominant for about 15 or 20 laps. And then he seems to go to the front. But this time he has a different car in front of him, in front of him than he has all day. He has not been behind Darrell Walter, so it might be something he, somebody he, he cannot catch. Yeah, we, we talked about the first five cars just to go back and pick up the rest of the guys who are on the lead lap. Rusty Wallace turning in a tremendous performance today is indeed six. There's the leaders, Walter and Allison. Ron Bouchard, seven. And Ricky Rudd hanging on by his fingertips in eighth position, still on the lead lap. So, you know, wouldn't that be the ultimate irony? We have not talked about Ricky Rudd all day today. In the spring, that was all there was to talk about. What if we have a late caution and all of a sudden Ricky Rudd pops up and win? That'd be justice, wouldn't it? It really would. Well, fuel mileage should probably not be a factor in today's race. As a matter of fact, a caution flag at lap 240 probably would have meant everybody could go the distance. We had one at 260, so Dick, I think everybody said as far as fuel. Yeah, they probably are, Larry. At this point, however, the fuel calculations are indeed going on. These are standard toolbox. That's the sort of stuff everybody uses. Right underneath in Tim Pitt Richmond's pit, they're using not just one, but two computers to keep track of his fuel consumption. When they finish a pit stop, they weigh the amount of fuel that did not go into the tank by an electronic digital scale. Then they pump it into one of these two computers to try to calculate the exact fuel miles. Now they can plot number of yellow flag laps, green flag laps, and right now let's go back to the racetrack. We've got to spin. Well, Dick, it was a close call. There were no leaders directly behind Ron Bouchard, but Ron Bouchard, who had been running in seventh position, he scattered one. Coming down the front stretch, the smoke began at about the start-finish line. Ron had a good handle on the car. He got into the banking of turn number one, downhill, incidentally, and boy, it took off, and I think it was because he was running in pure oil, and they don't go real fast or real straight in oil. 
Nobody else involved. Tommy Ellis, the closest one, Ben. He did a good job avoiding it, but it looked like curtains for Bouchard. Yes, we can see right between where he says Randolph on the back of the car that that dark streak on that white pavement there is the lubricant, either oil or water, that, that Bouchard lost. Well, there is the very end of the incident. You see Rusty Wallace going by on the high side. They were racing for position, Wallace and Bouchard. Ronnie really did an excellent job because the oil was being sprayed on his rear tires for about half of the front stretch. And there you see Tommy Ellis. We mentioned him going by doing a real fine job. There's a lot of oil in that corner right now. This may be about a five or six sec, five or six lap yellow flag for Ron Bouchard. And I think he's going to need uh, more than a shove back to his pit area, Benny. It looked like the car was was running. It looked like he pulled the car back to that position or drove it back to that position. But evidently, he just was coasting. Of course, he's going downhill sort of at that point, too. Well, I don't know. It, it, that's being, I don't know if it is, if it's like, downhill or uphill. That's like Mystery Hill down there. You're going downhill into turn number one, but there's banking. I guess it makes it almost like flat to the uh, horizon. Well, some of these streams around here flow uphill, so anything can happen in North Wilkesboro. See, you know, I believed that when I was a little kid, too. I've really been disappointed. Well, at any rate, there are the leaders, Bobby Allison. and No, Bobby Allison is second at this point. I beg your pardon. Waltrip had moved around and taken over the number one position. A couple of laps before this yellow. Harry Gant. Now the first five cars are in a row. There are no lap cars between them. It is Waltrip in the Budweiser Junior Johnson. Doug Hammond, chief, number 11, followed by Bobby Allison, Harry Gant, Dale Earnhardt, and Neil Bonnet. We'll be back with more from North Wilkesboro. People, a small apology in trying to refer to the crew chief for Darrell Waltrip. I may have called Jeff Hammond, Doug Hammond, of course, Doug Richard and Jeff Hammond, Jeff Hammond for Darrell and Doug for the number 12 car of Neil Bonnet. Really, Benny, two of the crew chiefs in this league who have among the brightest futures of anybody. Very young man who does a very good job. Restart time, Larry. Back to racing again. I tell you, I remember back in the spring, the first time you hear that roar, it's kind of exciting, you know that? It really is. <laughs> now let's just sit back here for a couple of laps and watch the masters at work. Labonte is trying to uh, show a little bit of strength here. You see him on the inside of Allison. Waltrip leading the pack, leading the race. Tim Richmond second in line. Bobby Allison on the white car. Points later, Labonte a lap down on the inside. Kind of surprising that Labonte is trying that hard to get his lap back. Well, at this point, with more than 100 laps to go, if he could get it back early, Benny, it's a big advantage. And this is probably the best shot he's going to have to get back in this race. If he doesn't get it done, get back on the lead lap in the next 25, it's over as far as victory. That's true. I, I agree with you 100%. Meanwhile, Darrell Waltrip has put some distance on Bobby Allison. Bobby's having trouble getting by Tim Richmond, and Darrell Waltrip is driving away. Oh, boy. If you're in any other pit area other than the Junior Johnson pit right now, your eyes have got to be rolling around. Is this Waltrip taking a hold of this race? Is this the Darrell Waltrip who has won so many times? Is this the Junior Johnson prepared machine that from time to time has been absolutely invincible here at North Wilkesboro? You know, there are those who will tell you this is almost like Junior's private test track. But then again, Junior Johnson has won a couple of races at other speedways, so I know that it's necessarily just because it's in his own backyard. Junior Johnson has enormous experience in preparing Grand National race cars. There's Darrell's wife, Stevie. She says hello to her mom. And some other remark, maybe. Darrell Waltrip, the current money leader in Grand National Racing with almost $565,000. Well, NASCAR and ESPN is proud to present to you as we do each and every season a series of track facts, and here is yet another. Every so often you have to change the air filter in a passenger car. It does get dirty. When you change it, you just throw it away. More and more racing cars are using filters like these that you don't throw away. When the filter gets dirty, Put it in some sort of parts degreaser, which cleans it up, spray it with a thin film of oil, put it back on again. This filter is good probably even longer than I'll live. The average speed of the race, 92 miles an hour, the top five, Waltrip, Allison, Gant, Earnhardt, 
and Neil Bonnet in car number 12. About 100 laps to go. Number one, a Holly Farms 400, starting further back than fifth place since 1963. Now, the top five starters today were Waltrip, Bonnet, Gant, Jeff Bodine. He's out of it. And Elliot, he's probably out of it. So it looks like, unless Bobby Allison can bring home the bacon here, that that particular strand of people starting in the top five and winning may be held intact. Very few cars have dropped out of this race. Buddy Arrington started Ronnie Thomas's number 41. He dropped out. He was one of only three people who is not on this racetrack among those who started this race. One of the people who has moved into Grand National Racing in the last half of the 1984 season is a guy who's a former USAC National Sprint Car and Dirt Car Champion. He's driving Elmo Langley's Sunny King Ford Honda Special, the number 64, Ken Schrader. He had a spectacular career in the open wheel cars. Kenny is a very versatile driver, Benny. I have seen him win on a mile dirt and a midget. I've seen him win on a sprint car and a half mile racetrack and even win on a high bank half mile racetrack at Winchester doing just a fantastic and sometimes scary job. Well, I haven't watched him race that much in, in the divisions that he has been dominant, but then just talking to him, awfully nice young man, and really wants to, seems like he wants to have a future in Grand National Racing. Well, he's very serious about race driving. By the way, right now he's 20th in position, 20th position in the race. Greg Sachs, by the way, is right behind Kenny, another one of the rookies. And Kenny was one of the most active drivers in all of automobile racing the last five or six years. He will run 70 to 80 times a year, rivaling the likes of Bobby Allison in that particular category. He has run stock cars on dirt. He's run stock cars on pavement. We mentioned his expertise in the open wheel sprint cars, midgets, and championship dirt cars. The yeah, Walter, right now, Larry, it just, he's seems to be pulling away. Bobby Allison has lost some of the dominance that he had, that he had earlier on. Now, they're working on a setup that they got about 25 laps ago during a pit stop. The track, to me, does appear to be changing. The back markers are sliding more now in the corners than they were in the earlier stages of the race. So just because Waltrip is dominant now, that doesn't necessarily mean with all the laps we have remaining in this race, about 90, that he'll have this type of advantage the rest of the race. Well, there was an interesting announcement that we all anticipated uh, about a week ago in Charlotte, North Carolina, Kyle Petty marrying the Woods Brothers. The Hatfields and McCoys, so to speak, joined up. Kyle Petty will be leading Petty Enterprises for the first time in his career. And going on with the Wood Brothers next year, the 7-Eleven sponsorship goes, and we won't see number 42 again. Or will we next year? Well, I don't know. There is talk that Maurice Petty and Sam Ard, one of the longtime sportsman drivers, uh, may get together and field a car out of Petty Enterprises. But that's just speculation. And the Wood Brothers, the number 21 is going away, Larry. The, the number that David Pearson made so famous is going away. The car next year will be number seven, as Kyle Petty's car is this year. And also with an announcement from the Gatorade folks earlier this week, there will be no number 88 on the trail next year. So at least two of the traditional numbers are going to drop by the wayside in 1985. Kyle's best finish, by the way, in 1984 was right here at North Wilkesboro in the spring when he finished in fifth position. Had an excellent chance to win that race, as a matter of fact. Well, the Wood Brothers entered here this week and talk about the Hatfields and McCoys. Son of a gun. There they are. Uh, the Woods Brothers car with Buddy Baker behind the wheel throughout the entirety of the 1984 season. Right now leading Richard Petty. It's an important time of the year for Richard Petty. Elections are coming up. There you can see Richard Petty breaking loose. I commented about the racetrack. He's very involved in politics, isn't he, Benny? Well, he's one of the big wigs in the North Carolina Republican Party and is a county commissioner down in Randolph County, his own county a Republican County Commissioner. So yes, he's very involved in politics. And if he were not racing full time right now, he probably would be even more involved in politics and would probably look for a higher office. Now there was a time at this racetrack that Richard Penny was really something here. You, you saw on the screen that he had won 10 straight times. He actually won both races in 1962. We're talking 20 years ago. And then he went on to win 14 more races, including eight of 11 during the years of 1970 through 1975. So Richard Petty has certainly had his days, his years in the sun 
here in the mountains of West Central North Carolina the North Wilkesboro Speedway. Well Darrell Waltrip is knocking him down lap after lap Waltrip headed for victory number six perhaps of the 1984 season we will soon know. The editors of Road and Track call the Pontiac 6000 STE one of the world's 12 best enthusiast cars. Car and driver called the Pontiac 6000 STE one of the 10 best cars of 1984. So why did we make it even better for 1985? Just because. The sensational 6000. Only from Pontiac. We build excitement. Pontiac. H.B. Scott won a gold medal at the 1904 World's Fair because he made chewing tobacco like no one else. Today, that tradition lives on in H.B. Scott's premium blend. It's specially cut in ribbons from the tender part of each leaf. And it's this special cut that makes H.B. Scott such a smooth, clean chew. No other chewing tobacco looks or tastes like it because no other brand is made like H.B. Scott's premium blend. There'll be another type of racing on ESPN during the months of October and November. Well, assuming you're still with us, with us, you just experienced history. I've been working these broadcasts since 1979. Well, if you're still with us, and obviously you are, you wouldn't be hearing me right now, you've just witnessed history. I've been doing these broadcasts since 1979, and that's the last time, or the first time, rather, that we've been off for more than a split second. There was a massive power outage here at the racetrack, and you didn't miss too much. Waltrip has been out front leading the race. Benny, you and I have been watching him carefully. About 10 laps to go, it looked like he was pulling away. That lead was stretching out, stretching tight like a rubber band. But now Allison is finding some slack in that rubber band. He's moving in. Bobby Allison is coming on. He's getting off the turns straight. Darrell Waltrip's car is getting a little bit loose. He seems to be losing the back end as he comes off to the turn. There's no doubt that the 22 car of Bobby Allison, the Miller Buick, is gaining. And at the same time, his teammate, the number 12 car of Neil Bonnet, continues to run third. He begins to inch forward just a little more. Dave Marcus, a guy who's been around for a number of years in Grand National Stock Car Racing, he won a lot of races in winged race cars back in the early 1970s, driving the famous k, &K Dodge machine. And Marcus hooked up with Raymock Racing in the 1984 season. And before the races began this weekend, Benny, they told me they really would like to sneak in a win, but boy, it's going to be a real uphill battle in these final four races, isn't it? It is, because I don't know, somehow the, the combination is not there, you know, and we talk about combination all the time, and who knows what it is? Who knows what makes it work? But just somehow the combination. Has, no, Dave Marcus, we're talking, he's in the wall up in turn three. Dave Marcus careening out of control. They're going into turn number three. There are people behind him who may be in trouble. Kenny Schrader up in the marbles. And Brother Parsons is up there. They slip through. And Marcus has crashed here at North Wilkesboro for the second time in the last two weeks. They crashed in practice on Friday of qualifying weekend, two weekends ago. The crew ran home. They spent all night rebuilding the race car, put brand new sheet metal all the way around. It was a tired crew and kind of a happy crew, really, when they rained out here two weeks ago because, boy, they were dragging. They'd had a long, long weekend and an even longer night. And Marcus has made contact with the cement in turn number three. Here's a replay on it, Benny. What do you think? Well, I think he cut out, ran over something, cut a right front tire because he goes in turn three. No problem. And the car about right now turns right. You can see it just and bang, he hits the wall. He was getting ready to put a lap on Bobby Gerhardt, the young second generation driver from the Lebanon, Pennsylvania area, the Frederick Chevrolet car. There's another angle and a closer view of Marcus. And boy, that car just took off. Just turned right. Something, he ran over a piece of metal, something, cut a right front tire. And when, when those tires go flat, 
you have basically no control over. You just cannot turn the thing. Just another example of how important the element of luck really can be in Grand National Racing. One of the people on the lead lap, Ricky Rudd, he was running in fourth position, has pitted. Check that. All the people on the lead lap, but we are watching those replays. All the leaders are in. Waltrip is out. Gant's leaving the pits. Allison is leaving the pits. Now the number 12 car of Neil Bonnet, Ricky Rudd, continues to sit. Although he's got a good 15 seconds or so before he has any jeopardy of going a lap down uh, to the other four cars in the lead lap. Now Rudd pulls away as we go back up front and check on Waltrip. Remember, he's already made his pit stop. Now the rest of the field, those down one and two laps, duck into the pits. And everybody will be making the final adjustments for the drive to the finish. Well, I'll, Benny, tell you, I'll tell you, in the spring, we had a situation very similar to this. Remember, Ricky Rudd had dominated this race. We had a caution okay. flag and it changed things all around. I remember that very well, Larry. One of the fellows that we've been in contact with today via two-way radio is Harry Gant. And at this point in time, let's talk to Harry We're and see what the his thoughts are for the remainder of the race. Harry Gant, this is Benny Parsons up in ESPN. Do you read me? Measure the car. It did help it a bit, but being loose, it just made it push more in the middle of the turn. It didn't have nothing to do with the wheel spinning at all. Right so now he's talking, he's talking to Travis Carter right now about the chassis they're trying to determine. Yeah, you're tapping into Harry Gant, this line. is Benny Parsons <laughs> up in the SPN. Do you read me? Yeah, 10-4, Benny. I'll read you all right. How's the car, Harry? Well, Benny, we're a little bit loose. Uh, it's having a little trouble here. The tires sort of flux away back and forth, but we've been changing the chassis at each time, so hopefully we've got the stagger and the chassis maybe a little better this time. It's uh, just a wild guess. It might be better, it might be worse. Well, Harry, the Harold Kinder's giving you one lap to go. We're going to leave you right now. Good luck for the remainder of the race. Well, let's set it up for you. Here are the top contenders and the guys going after victory here this afternoon. 70 laps to go, less than 50 miles. Here they are in order from the top. It's Waltrip. There he is in the white number 11. Harry Gant is second. He's right behind Waltrip. The leaders are in the outside row of this restart. Then Bobby Allison. Then hungry for victory, Neil Bonnet. Then Dale Earnhardt, Rusty Wallace, yes, still on the lead lap, and Ricky Rudd. Who will emerge from that group of seven for victory today? Very excited, I'll tell you that. I'm kind of excited myself, Larry. I think it's going to be a great 75 laps or 70 laps. Looking for a green flag. There's the shot right underneath. Harold Kinder starts then. Green flag. It's like starting all over again, except a lot of the hands have been played. Everybody's holding two or three cards. They hope they're a trump card, and they hope it propels them to victory. How fast is Waltrip going to be? Tim Richmond is trying to get one of his laps back. He lost another lap just a moment ago on that pit stop. He pitted early, and Darrell Waltrip did not come in a pitch. Tim Richmond lost another lap. Now, remember, we've told you several times during the broadcast, 70 laps to go. The temperature of the track is going to change in the next 70 laps. The condition of the track, somebody may be dropping just a little bit of liquid, maybe oil, maybe water. That's going to change. The temperature in the air might change just a little bit. The performance of the race car, a spring might go or come back. A lot of things could change. So just because you're fastest on the track right now does not necessarily mean you're going to be that fast in 70 laps from now. That's exactly right, because the car right now that is dominant as Darrell Walter, 60 laps about, may not be able to outrun the field. The one factor that everybody else up front would really like to rid themselves of, I was about to comment, is Tim Richmond. And Tim did move over that time and let Harry get by easily on the inside. That's exactly right. He just moved over and said, look, I don't have a chance to win this thing. I'm three laps down. Why don't you guys that have a chance to win? Go ahead. Well, Bobby Allison is now approaching Tim Richmond. We'll see how Tim handles it uh, with Bobby Allison this time. Harry Gant runs in second. He told us before the race began he's going all out for victory, and Dick Bergman is in the skull pit right now. Yeah, and I'm with the youngest pit crew member of any on pit road with young Zach Hayes. He's the son of Johnny Hayes, who's the car owner here. Zach, 11 years old, going on 12. A lot of responsibility. What do you do here on pit road? Well, I just pull gas, you know. Uh, every Sunday, and I just try working as hard as I can. Pulling gas means that he's the guy that takes the empty fuel cans down to the pump, gets them all filled up again. But you were even working on the car before the start of the race. What were you doing? You were working on the car before the start of the race. What were you doing to it? 
I was torquing the tires and, you know, checking them over to see if they were right. Do you want to be a race car driver or a pit crew member? I believe a pit crew member. At 12 years old, he's got a head start. Well, Dick Bergen, the Johnny Hayes that you referred to is the car owner of mine and Phil Parsons' car. Harry Gant is, I mean, Al Needham is the owner of Harry Gant's car. Trouble in turn one. Three cars have come together. It's Greg Sachs is involved. Buddy Baker is involved. Sachs has made contact with the outside wall. And Trevor Boys, the track is almost completely blocked. You can see there is a lane way down on the inside of the track and one right up along the outside wall. Greg Sachs hitting the outside wall with a great deal of force. You can see the damage to that machine. Trevor Boys pulling away and lots of scrambling going on in the pack as the leaders come up on this crash scene. And boy, we're going to be yellow for a number of laps here. Now, if you didn't like your setup, Benny, if you're in the top seven, you got another shot at it. Yeah, and the thing is, on a NASCAR restart, Larry, I hope I have time to explain this. On a NASCAR restart, the cars in the lead lap have the privilege of pulling up on the outside lane Benny, and let me interrupt you for just a second. A streak of oil leading up to Greg Sachs' car, I think he, too, lost an engine going into turn number one because that oil was way down the front stretch from where the incident occurred. There is Buddy Baker. Kyle Petty, that's Kyle. That's Kyle Petty, sorry, on the outside there. And Sachs apparently has already made contact with the outside wall or perhaps with uh, Trevor Boyce because you can see the damage there before the car even comes to a stop. There's, a, there's so much damage there that it really looks like it's the outside retaining wall, but we'll just have to, we won't speculate on that. Well, here's a modified driver who's come to the Southland to stake his claim for gold and riches in Grand National Stock Car Racing. But for Greg Sachs, it'll have to wait until another day. Privilege of pulling up on the outside in the outside lane and passing all the cars, this is on a restart on a caution flag, passing all the cars that are at least a lap or more down. So Ricky Rudd was a seventh place car, and we only have seven cars in the lead lap. He could come in, put on four fresh tires, go back on the racetrack, and pull right up on the bumper of the 88 car driven by Rusty Wallace. He hasn't lost a thing, and he has, a, he has on four fresh tires. A brilliant move on Bud Moore's part. Well, he has at least the potential for having an advantage that he didn't have during the last yellow flag, or last green flag. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we're going to pick up now with Harry again and see if we can raise Harry on the radio. One, one time, I think. Harry Gant, this is Benny Parsons in ESPN. Do you read me? Yeah, I'll read you, Benny. Whose decision was it not to stop and put on four tires? Well, it's Darrell didn't stop, and it seems like this is probably the best that we've had uh, the last three sets, so we started to stick with them no more laps than we had run. Okay, did, did you see what happened to Greg Sachs and, uh, and the 48 car of Trevor Boys? What caused the crash? No, I, was, I didn't uh, see the crash. I was too far back. I think I was on the back stretch when he hollered the crash in the fourth and first turn. Is the racetrack still as slippery as it was at the beginning of the race, or is it getting better as the as it gets a little cooler? Well, it's a little slick for me running up high. Uh, it's, uh, you know, about like, it's not as bad as uh, it usually gets. It's really pretty good shape. Uh, you know, it's a little bit rough down low, and it's starting to dig up just a little bit of that loose asphalt makes you a little squirrely. But other than that, it's uh, not too bad. I think we just have a a little bit wrong combination on the rear of the car here to really get it hooked up good. Well, Harry, there's 60 laps to go. Good luck. Thank you, Betty. North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We're just over from Blowing Rock and down the road from Mount Airy, up the mountain from Brooks Crossroads, also near where Tom Dooley is buried. We'll be back. Season it has been already. Alabama beating Penn State, shutting them out. Syracuse beating Nebraska. And on ESPN on Saturday, the 20th of October at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time at 7.30 Saturday night, Oklahoma versus Iowa State. Oklahoma, of course, fresh off that tie with Texas and Woodenberry Switzer, liked to have that call back when he accepted the safety and had to settle eventually for a tie with the Longhorns of Texas. It's Oklahoma versus the Cyclones of Iowa State next Saturday on ESPN. And we're back to green here at North Wilkesboro. 50 laps to go. And it's just a good old-fashioned shootout. That's all this is. It really is. Darrell Walton has the he has the gun cocked. But Harry Gant says, wait a minute, you're not going to drive away from me. Bobby Allison is back there. Neil Bonnie. The 88 car, Rusty Wallace. Boy, what a great thing it'd be if he could win this race. Wouldn't that be a story? 
Benny, and the last time we were green, as brief as it was, I didn't think that Waltrip was in a real good position. It, it looked to me like Harry and Bobby were at least keeping pace and maybe running him down. But right now, these first couple of green flag laps here, he seems to be pulling away a little bit. You know, he may not win the points this year, but as always, Darrell's got some very strong opinions about the system. You may agree with them, you may differ from them. I'm not an advocate of the current point system. The structure, yes. I, I can uh, uh, appreciate that everybody gets some points. That's the way it should be. But let's don't make the point system something that we can use for a crutch. Sure, everybody, you got to finish races. That's how you win championships. But let's throw out the worst three or the worst five finishes that a guy has. Let's, you want to see a championship race? Let's tighten it up a little bit. Let's get some of the cars that are not factors early in the year back in it at the end of the year by virtue of letting a guy go out on that racetrack, drive his heart out, and win a race and get some bonus points and catch back up. Let's make it interesting. By this time every year, the championship is practically decided because the structure of the system won't allow you to make any gains. I won the race in, in uh, Martinsville and I gained 10 points because Terry runs second. Well, that's, you know, him running second is great. He's doing exactly what he has to do. I'm not criticizing him or anybody else in any way. But when a man drives his heart out to win a race, me, Harry Gant, Dale Earnhardt, whoever it is, he should get some kind of bonus for that. You get bonuses for leading a lap. You can lead a lap under a caution flag. Now, I, I mean, and that gets you five bonus points. That's not fair. Why give a guy five bonus points under a caution and won't give him a bonus for winning the race? Let's get some, let's get some incentive to win. That's what this game's all about. Terry Labonte right now is out doing exactly what Darrell Waltrip was describing. He's out driving for points right now. And Darrell's last statement, Benny, sums it up. He wants more points, more emphasis placed on winning. And I got to tell you, Benny, that three, four years ago when I first started really paying attention to the system, I was very strongly in favor of the way it now is. I like the idea that a lot of people had a shot at the championship. But you know, I'm listening now, and uh, I haven't really changed my opinion, but I think I'm a little more open-minded about it. Well, you know, he said something that I hadn't heard before in, in throw out three or four of your worst finishes. You know, take 20 of the best finishes or 25 of the best finishes to determine the champion. I hadn't heard that before, but I tell you what, it would really make it very interesting and very tight, and it would put more emphasis on winning. Well, you know, that's the way it used to be done in Formula One standings. Your worst finishes were thrown out. Now that they've expanded the schedule, they seem to have done away with that because everybody always has two or three DNFs in that highly competitive league. But uh, it is a, a system and it's an approach that other types of racing have used. Greg Sachs, the modified driver from the Northeast who had the altercation with Trevor Boys in the wall, is with Dick Bergren. Greg, what caused the crash? Well, I'll tell you, Dick. Uh, Trevor Boys and LD Auditor were going at it pretty good. And they got together a little bit, and then Trevor went around. I just kind of had nowhere to go, and t bought him in the front straightaway. It's just one of those things. How are you? You were holding your back when you got out of the car. Are you all right? No, I feel fine. I'm just going to make it a little during the race. It wasn't caused by the wreck. I feel fine. You're going to be able to run next week? Oh, yeah, we'll be back. Greg Sachs, tough customer. He'll be back next week. Well, so much for the oil streak that Larry Newber imagined, Benny yeah. Parsons. <laughs> yeah, well, it, when he broke the radiator and the oil cooler, that's where yeah. the oil and water came from. Well, I tried to help him. <laughs> well, 40 laps to go, and it's like a trophy dash, although right now Daryl Waltrip has a firm hold on the helmet straps. Waltrip has lengthened his lead over Harry Gant to about 10 car lengths. Bobby Allison is doing his best. He's about two or three car lengths behind Harry. There is first Waltrip. Harry Gantz in the green and white 33. Then next in line is Allison. There he is in the bottom of the screen. And fourth place is Neil Bonnet. And boy, you got to feel for Bonnet. He really would like to win a race. They'd like to get out of this season with a victory. The early part of this race, the first quarter, he looked like the guy to beat. And now he just can't get to the top rung of that ladder anymore. No, he just can't. He does seem to have muscle to get back up there. But you know, Darrell Walter right now, right now is really taking it fair, as easy as you can take it and leave because he wants to keep the tires as cool as he possibly can for that last charge. Yeah, it's certainly not over yet, Benny. No, it isn't. Bill Parsons, my younger brother, there he is on the screen, is, continues to have trouble. He continues to, to get a little bit sideways as he goes and turns. He's going to go in and let the car, well, this time he stays on the bottom of the racetrack, and we can see him as he comes off the turns. 
just losing the back end ever so slightly. It's been dirt tracking on him all day long. His best finish this year is a seventh. You know, talking with him earlier this weekend, asking about the biggest difference, Benny, between this and the late model sportsman that he spent so much time in. It's the weight. You know, it really gives you an altogether different feel. And he said that here at a racetrack like this, it was very difficult for him to avoid overdriving into the corners. He had a tendency just to cook her in there too hot, and that was his problem getting around fast. You know, that's the thing. I think that's the thing that, that most newcomers to our sport have, Larry, is the weight. Because this is the heaviest race car in the world today. It's 3,700 pounds. The late model sportsman is 3,400 pounds. The Formula One cars are what, 1,600 pounds. The Indy cars are 16, 1,700 pounds. The dirt track cars are around 22, 2,300 pounds. These cars are extremely heavy, and it takes a great deal of experience with this race car to be able to handle it. Think of Kenny Schrader coming out of the midgets that weigh less than a thousand pounds. It's a heavy race car. There's a pretty good horsepower to weight ratio. You still got an awful lot of power. And the big problem is if you have little experience in these cars, once you get in trouble, it's real difficult to say. It really is. I think the field basically has did a good job this year in adjusting to the heavier cars from the late model sportsman division. See there he almost got sideways again coming off turn four. Well, and we also talked to him about whether or not he saw this year as failure, disappointment, or success. And I feel like it's been a successful year. And pretty much everybody in the crew, including Phil, they also believe that it's been a successful year. We talked to him about that a little earlier, Benny. Well, uh, based, not really. It's, it's easy to step back and see. But uh, nothing was really uh, that astronomical a surprise other than uh, the difference between Grand National cars weighing 3,700 uh, 3, pounds and the sportsman cars I'm used to weighing 2,950 pounds. That's quite a difference, and it's a lot harder to get to the Grand National cars to hook up to the racetrack. Uh, car, you can come to a place like North Wilkesboro here, and uh, you can basically run the run the same speed all day long. You know, Grand National, you come here in, a, in a about 30 laps, run a second slower than you qualified. So there's quite a difference. Well, Little Bro has won $87,000 this year and may well be en route to winning 100. I think the record for most $100,000 winners in a year is like 26, Benny, and we're climbing up to that total again this season. So lots of money to be won here, even if you're finishing 8th through 15th. Well, there is a great deal of money. Darrell Waltrip doesn't run off and leave her again. They're kind of staying stationary right now. But as I said, they are staying stationary. Harry Gant is not picking up Darrell Waltrip. And Harry doesn't have it about 70 laps, 30 laps to go. If he's going to make a move on Darrell, he better hustle it up. Yeah, it's pretty unlikely, isn't it, Benny, that anybody, particularly in that top four, is holding anything back. I think whatever they got right now, they're showing it because they have no idea whether or not this will be green the West Leroy. If there's a yellow, it could change the complexion. It's never over till it's over, and we certainly saw that in the spring. Could that happen again? Less than 25 miles. Here is the race within the points. The top 10 in the points. Levante, Gant, Elliott, Earnhardt, Waltrip. Right now, Harry Gant's in second place in the race. The bottom of the top 10. It's a pretty good bottom, I'll tell you that. Allison, Bobby, Ricky Rudd, Neil Bonnet, Jeff Bodine, and Ron Bouchard. Ron Bouchard, the only driver in the top 10. Out of the race at this point, Jeff Bodine, many laps down with a serious anti-breaking problem it just don't work <laughs> they just don't stop that's exactly right you know we've talked about the points and and we made the statement that now it is down to two larry harry gant the car that we see right there the skull bandit the 44 car of terry labani who is currently in ninth spot that's a gain of about oh well, going into this race harry gant was 86 points behind if they finish where they are right now harry gant will gain about 25 27 points that will put him 60 behind four of those races he wins Levante runs second another interpretation remember we told you 23 positions approximately 23 positions is what Harry Gant has to beat Terry Levante by over the course of these last four races he's in a position to pick up a third of those 23 positions in this race alone and there'll be three laps left but you know something Levante is mighty good at that road course out in Riverside if it comes down to that Terry and Dale Earn Inman got to be feeling they're at a real advantage. Well, I think so because they did, in fact, win the race there in June. 
Terry Labonte won the race. As a matter of fact, I was kind of pulling for him to run second because I ran second that day. Yeah, but it wasn't the number uh, 55 car, was it? No, it was the number 12 car. I substituted for Neil Bonnet, who had a broken wrist that day. And the lead, we're, we've seen the lead again. Darrell Waltrip in the lead. There's Phil Parsons in between he and Harry again. But it stays the same. Harry doesn't gain. Darrell Waltrip doesn't gain. But Darrell don't need to gain anything because he already has about a seven-car advantage. Yeah, you know, in a situation like this, normally Benny would have a tendency to feel that Waltrip is sensing that he can't decimate the field. He can't, like Tom Dooley, hang everybody and run away with it. He is faster, but instead of really extending himself, I think he's got to where he wants to be and he's trying to hold on. There's the Wrangler cars right there. Ricky Rudd and Dale Earnhardt coming off the fourth corner. Rudd takes the position. That's for position six. Boy, Ricky talk Rudd moves into sixth spot. Talk about getting your basic exposure out of your advertisements on race cars, eh? <laughs> yeah. You know, the last month or so, these cars have been running very, very close everywhere they've been. It seems like every time you run, you look up that they're rubbing each other. The one advantage is that when they rub, it's not a different pain. You can't tell it, right? Well, Ricky's best finish in his career in the Winston Cup points has been a sixth. His best race finish of 1984 has been a first. He won at Richmond earlier this year. They'll be looking at new colors and a new sponsor for next year. But if it's a Bud Moore car, be rest assured the number 15 will return. It's a season in which Ricky has been fast from time to time. They they lost a couple of races that they felt certainly well were well within their grasp of one of them here at North. And Labonte way out of shape as he got hooked up with Earnhardt. And I'll tell you, Labonte took no chances. He got out of the throttle and just gathered her back in. No staying on the gas to straighten up for Terry. He knows he needs to finish. Well, I tell you what, that was very, very close. Terry Labonte did a super job saving that car. Well, You're Earnhardt, to see it. Earnhardt is lapping Labonte. Now, Labonte at this point seems to have advantage. I think we're coming out of turn two, down the backstretch. Now, Dale on the lead lap, running quicker. He catches Terry in the right rear. Oh, I don't, it looked like Labonte as he got off the turn, as he moved up in front of Earnhardt, got out of the throttle for some reason. Earnhardt just touched him in the right rear quarter. That was almost disaster for Terry Labonte. He can't stand one of those right now. And now Labonte gets him back. Terry Labonte has moved back around Earnhardt, but again, Earnhardt is on the lead lap. Labonte runs ninth. Earnhardt is sixth. Running down the top seven for you, those on the lead lap, it's Waltrip, Gant, Bobby Allison, Neil Bonnet, Rusty Wallace, now running in fifth, ahead of Ricky Rudd in sixth, and Dale Earnhardt in seventh. You know, we talked a moment ago, Ricky Rudd was the only car to come in and make a pit stop and put on four fresh tires. I really felt like that would be a tremendous advantage for him. It hasn't proven to be that yet there. You know, as we travel around the country, we have the privilege of comparing a lot of different kinds of races through these broadcasts on Auto Racing 84 and our Speed Week show. And it's interesting, a lot of racing as far as what goes on on the racetrack during the competition, of course, is the same. But there's a big difference in the individual application from one type of racing to another. Fire is something that all race drivers are concerned with, and it's handled differently in different divisions. Fire has been one of the greatest benefactors of mankind. But so, too, fire has been terrorizing to mankind. In no place has it evoked more fear than in automobile racing. Ask a group of race car drivers what they're afraid of most, and they'll tell you, fire. I guess it'd be fire. Many sanctioning bodies have extensive regulations about what drivers yeah. must wear to protect themselves in the event of fire. Some sanctioning bodies require that they wear fire suits, fireproof underwear, fireproof gloves, fireproof socks and shoes. Such is not the case, however, in NASCAR, where the rule book only says fire suits are recommended. And here, in Winston Cup racing, the majority of competitors take great liberties with fire protection. The majority do not wear fireproof underwear. Many don't wear fireproof gloves. And it is only my, the minority that, in fact, wear fireproof socks and shoes. It's fortunate in Winston Cup racing that fire is seldom a problem. For if these cars caught fire more frequently, perhaps there would be greater levels of injury. Tim, you're, you're racing apparel in a Grand National stock car. Yours, Tim Richmond's as an individual, is a lot different than what it was when you were driving an Indy car. Does that concern you? Not really. You know, here, uh, I'm sure a lot of Indy car drivers think that we're more unsafe because we don't wear the Nomex underwear and stuff. But in reality, we're probably safer by not wearing it because as hot as it gets in these race cars, up to 150, 160 degrees, it's sometimes 
with that much insulation and, and body heat retained in, uh, inside the suit, uh, there's a possibility of, of passing out or, or dehydrating or something, and the safety becomes a, a lot more dangerous because of that than without it. So I think you're in this in this type of racing, you're safer without the Nomex underwear than you are with it. We know Larry Tim Richmond is, exact, is exactly right because these cars, the stock cars, the engines are in the front and the, the exhaust goes right underneath the driver and it gets so hot inside those cars that it's unbelievable. It's just incredible how hot it gets. And with all that insulation, I think he's right. You dehydrate and there's no way that you get enough moisture in your body. Well, Benny, we're down to the final strokes, about five laps to go. It's heating up for third place, but not for first. Darrell Waltrip looks like he has a stranglehold on the number one position. Harry Gant runs second. Right now, Allison and Neil Bonnet battle for third. You know, we started 30 cars in this race. We're watching Waltrip. There's the second place car, Harry Gant, as they complete the 400 lapper here at North Wilkesboro. Among those who came here to North Wilkesboro with high hopes two weeks ago who did not qualify for this race, Buddy Arrington, Jeff Hooker, Buddy Boys, James Ingold, Bobby Fox, Brent Elliott, Johnny McFadden, and Maurice Randall. And it comes down to, it looks like, another Darrell Waltrip victory. Here is that race for third. Neil Bonnet was on the outside of Bobby Allison just a moment ago, but wasn't able to get by. Bobby squeezed him. Two laps to go. Darrell Waltrip, he has been invincible here from time to time. And it looks like that time to time is extending for yet another race. What's this, four in a row now for this fall race here at North Wilkesboro? Four in a row here at North Wilkesboro. Waltrip has won so many times as he takes the white flag. He has one more lap to go. Darrell Waltrip with seven wins, all of course coming in the last decade. He now moves to the inside of Dick Brooks going down the backstretch. He decides to kind of hold forth there. He can see Harry again in his mirror. Harry can come right up and tap Darrell in the back bumper. Waltrip knows he's got the line. Out of turn number four, racing down into the checker flag, and Waltrip has win number seven. Gann is second. Allison holds off Bonnet for fourth and fifth place will go to Rusty Wallace. Here comes Rusty out of turn number four, and Rusty Wallace records one of his better finishes of the 1984 season. Darrell Waltrip, who has now won eight times of the 21 times he has started this race, he has a terrific winning percentage, well above 33% here at the North Wilkesboro Speedway. The Holly Farms 400, victory number seven for Darrell Waltrip, and Darrell rolls the familiar number 11 down pit road. He's headed toward victory lane. Darrell Waltrip winning this one. Harry Gant picking up a lot of valuable points toward the season's championship. We'll document you on that a little later. Thank you.